we planned a simple, fun getaway. My husband, our two kids and I thought it would be great to visit the rolling hills and quiet towns of Maine for a change. It wasn't supposed to be complicated. Hiking, fresh air, and just being together. To save some cash, we first booked a hotel, but when we arrived, it was a dump. My husband was furious, so we quickly changed plans and booked an Airbnb instead. That decision would haunt us for the rest of our lives. The Airbnb was tucked away on a remote road. On the second night of our trip, we pulled up to this place. It was sunny, warm, and the kids were bouncing with excitement. The house sat surrounded by trees, miles away from any neighbors, with towering oaks framing the driveway. It was a rustic log cabin with a porch that wrapped around the whole thing, giving off that isolated but cozy vibe. Inside, it felt bigger than it looked. The living room alone seemed to take up half the house, which felt a bit off. There were three bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a decent kitchen. Our host introduced himself as Greg. He was friendly enough, showing us around and even leaving a batch of fresh biscuits on the kitchen counter with butter and jam. The kids, picky as always, wouldn't touch them. My husband and I, however, devoured them without a second thought. Greg seemed nice, polite, nothing odd. We didn't think anything of it. We spent the first couple of days exploring the trails nearby and enjoying how peaceful the area was. Then, on the fourth day, things began to feel wrong. It started with little things. I'd find our stuff had been moved around while we were out. The front door would be unlocked, even though I was sure I'd locked it every time. At first, I brushed it off, thinking maybe I was just distracted or the kids were messing with things when I wasn't looking. Then, one afternoon, I began noticing something strange. Greg, our host, seemed to be everywhere we went. Whenever we left the house, his old truck was never far behind. No matter where we drove, he was always a few cars back, just lingering. It wasn't even subtle. I could feel his gaze following us. I mentioned it to my husband, but he shrugged it off, thinking I was imagining things. Even when I pointed him out once, he dismissed it, saying, What can we do? It's probably a coincidence. But the unease was creeping in, and I started regretting the whole decision of staying at the Airbnb. It didn't feel like a vacation anymore. It felt wrong. A couple of days later, we decided to head into town for some groceries and a bit of sightseeing. As we walked through the small downtown area, I spotted Greg again. This time, he was walking on the opposite side of the street, just far enough to not seem obvious, but close enough to make me nervous. Every time we stopped, I could see him pausing too, his phone awkwardly raised, as if he was snapping pictures of us. It wasn't hard to tell what he was doing. It was obvious. My stomach twisted in knots, and I could tell my husband was finally getting irritated too. When we got back to the cabin later that day, I found more of our stuff had been moved around. This time, it wasn't just little things, and I knew it wasn't the kids. My husband wasn't as dismissive anymore, but still, he wasn't ready to panic. I, on the other hand, was done with it. I went straight to Greg and demanded an explanation. He smiled, nervously, and said something about accidentally moving things while he was cleaning. Cleaning? He wasn't supposed to be entering the house while we were staying there, let alone touching our stuff. It was beyond weird, and I made sure to tell him so, but all he did was nod and mumble more excuses. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every tiny sound outside had me on edge. Every time the wind rustled the trees or the house creaked, I imagined Greg standing outside, just staring into the house with those unsettling eyes of his. The thought made my skin crawl. Eventually, I shook my husband awake, telling him we had to do something. We decided to contact Airbnb's customer service and tell them what was going on. They promised to look into it and said they'd get in touch with Greg, making sure everything was all right. I wasn't convinced, but at least it felt like we were doing something. The next morning, Greg showed up at our door, acting like everything was perfectly normal. This time, he came with a basket of fruit and veggies, mumbling an apology for any misunderstandings. He claimed he was just looking out for us, wanting to make sure everything was okay. I smiled politely, but inside, alarm bells were ringing. I was beginning to seriously regret not sticking with the hotel, 
or at least picking a different Airbnb. As the days went on, Greg's behavior got more unsettling. He'd show up randomly at the house, always with some excuse, needing to fix a problem or check on the property for maintenance. It felt like he was finding reasons to invade our space, to be around us when we didn't want him there. My husband and I finally agreed we should cut the trip short and leave the place early. I kept pushing my husband to confront Greg, to tell him off, maybe even threaten him, but each time, he'd just shake his head and say, Babe, it's his place. He has the right to do whatever he wants. We can't fight him. That didn't sit well with me at all, but I felt trapped, unsure of how to handle the situation. Then, everything went from creepy to downright terrifying. One morning, we woke up, and Greg was inside the house. He was just standing there in the middle of our living room, like he belonged there. I screamed, and my husband immediately called the police. Greg didn't even try to leave. He just stood there, looking at us like we were the crazy ones. When the cops showed up, they took him away in cuffs. Turns out, this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. Other guests had reported him acting bizarrely, but we had no idea. We packed our things as quickly as we could and left Maine that same day. Not long after, we found out that Greg's Airbnb listing had been removed, and he was banned from renting out any properties again. What was supposed to be a peaceful vacation had turned into something out of a horror movie. We couldn't get out of there fast enough. Looking back, we should have trusted our instincts and left the moment we saw him taking pictures of us in town. We put our trust in a complete stranger, and it almost cost us our safety. I hate thinking about what could have happened. Our kids were just down the hall and the idea that he could have walked into their room. It's a nightmare I can't shake. Even now, I try to tell myself maybe Greg was just an eccentric, clueless guy who didn't realize how inappropriate his behavior was. Maybe he genuinely thought he was being helpful, but deep down, I know better. Since that trip, we've struggled to feel safe when booking anywhere to stay. The kids are especially freaked out scared that someone's going to come back and invade their space again. Every time we talk about going on another trip, there's always that nagging fear that we'll never feel safe again. I decided to give myself a break and take a short trip away. I live in a pretty dull, flat part of the country, so I figured somewhere more scenic, with trees and mountains, would be a nice change. I ended up choosing Vermont, though I wasn't too familiar with the small towns. The popular places were expensive, so I started checking out Airbnbs in less known areas. There weren't a lot of options that fit my budget, but I did find one that looked all right. I booked it, packed up, and set out a week later, driving through rural back roads. Ten hours later, I finally reached the little town where I'd be staying. As I drove through, I began to feel uneasy. It was way more run down than I imagined. I wasn't expecting much, but this was worse than I thought. A few old houses lined the cracked road, and rusty power lines swayed on either side. The whole place felt abandoned, especially since it was night. I kept telling myself it'd probably look better in the daylight, but first impressions aren't easy to shake. Eventually, I found the gravel driveway leading to the Airbnb, tucked away in a small circle of five houses. I parked my car, grabbed my bags, and headed to the front door. The place was small, just a cozy little 500 square foot cabin. It was nicer than I expected though, and the layout was cute. I dropped my stuff in the bedroom and went to the kitchen to fill up a water bottle. As I stood by the counter, I heard a car crunching on the gravel outside. Curious, I glanced out the window. A pair of headlights slowly pulled into the circle, stopping in front of the house next door. The engine cut off and the lights went out but no one got out of the car. I waited a minute, feeling slightly unsettled, but whoever it was stayed inside. Not wanting to seem nosy, I shrugged it off and went back to the kitchen, deciding it was none of my business. I sat down on the kitchen stool, checking my phone and replying to a few texts, letting my folks know I'd arrived without any issues. After maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I decided to call it a night. I unpacked a few things and started getting ready for bed. That's when I heard a car door outside. It opened, then shut softly, followed by footsteps on the gravel. 
They got pretty close to the house, but I figured it was just someone going into the place next door. The steps suddenly stopped, which was strange, but I shrugged it off and finished up, crawling into bed not long after. I must have fallen asleep pretty quickly, but at some point, I woke up and something felt off. I had no idea what time it was, but the room felt different. I lay there, completely still, just listening. The house creaked here and there, but it was otherwise dead quiet. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I noticed the window across the room, and that's when I saw it, two eyes staring at me through the glass. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. I couldn't move, and for what felt like forever, those eyes just stared back at me. Then, in the dim light, I saw the figure slowly move away from the window. I barely heard the footsteps as they left, but it didn't sound like they were going far. My brain was racing, and I threw the covers off, quickly trying to get dressed. Before I could even get my shoes on, I heard something right outside my bedroom door. It was heavy, deliberate footsteps walking down the hallway. Whoever it was, they were inside. My breath caught in my throat, and I stood still, listening as they walked through the house. Then, the footsteps moved outside, crunching along the gravel path. I waited, not daring to move until I heard a car engine start and drive off. After what felt like an eternity, I carefully opened the door and walked down the hallway. The front door was wide open, the cool night air blowing in. I stood there for a minute, the silence pressing in, but whoever had been in my house was gone. The police station was a good 20 minutes away, but I called them anyway. I explained what happened, but nothing ever came of it. No follow-up, no explanation. I didn't stick around long enough to figure out who it was or what they wanted. I packed my stuff the next morning and left, still rattled by the thought of those eyes watching me in the dark. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to leave the hustle of Miami and head to the Midwest, landing in a small town near Kansas City. We didn't know anyone there, but after a few years of saving, we figured we could take the leap. It felt thrilling, and we've never looked back. The idea was simple, stay at budget hotels or shared spaces until we could lock down jobs and an apartment. The jobs came surprisingly fast. We both found work within days of touching down. But finding a place to live, that was a different story. Every apartment had ridiculous requirements. Things like credit scores I didn't even know existed and salaries we weren't close to hitting. After months of couch surfing and crashing in different cheap hotels, desperation started to creep in. Eventually, I started checking out Airbnb listings, hoping to find something more affordable. Most places were still giving us a hard time, but one listing caught my eye. The ad was weird though. This guy was offering a huge room in his house, 500 square feet, utilities included, for just $500. And this wasn't in a bad area either. The way he wrote the ad was... odd. Half of it seemed like a regular listing, but the other half was him ranting about how people in the neighborhood didn't get him, and that he wasn't some kind of weirdo. Normally, I'd stay far away from something like that, but our funds were drying up fast. If we didn't find something soon, we were going to be in trouble. So, against our better judgment, we gave the guy a call. He actually sounded pretty normal over the phone and even suggested we meet at a local diner to discuss everything. We agreed, but we didn't mention where we were staying. He showed up about 15 minutes late, and I swear he looked shocked that we even showed up. He talked a lot, and when I say a lot, I mean he barely let us get a word in. Most of what he said was about how everyone in town treated him unfairly and didn't appreciate his art or his collections. He wouldn't stop bringing up these collections, but never really explained what they were. He said the room was currently full of his stuff, and if things worked out, he'd have to hire someone to move it into storage before we could stay. At one point, in the middle of another one of his rambles, he just bolted for the bathroom. That gave us a chance to talk. We knew he was probably not right in the head, but we were running out of time. We agreed that we'd at least go check out the place before making a final decision. We didn't realize it at the time, but later it all made sense. Out of nowhere, he suddenly blurted, 
I want to show you the room right now. We were taken aback since we had just been talking about checking it out, but agreed anyway. I asked him to text me the address so we could take the bus over. He wasn't having that though, insisted on driving us himself, probably noticing we didn't have a car. Now both of us were super uneasy about getting in his truck. I think he could sense our hesitation, but once again, we were desperate. It didn't seem like he'd harm us, just a gut feeling. But looking back, it wasn't the smartest move. So we squeezed into his beat up, rusty old pickup. My girlfriend was crammed against the passenger door, while I was way too close to this guy, who kept rambling about how the city had changed and how all his old friends wanted nothing to do with him now. I leaned over and whispered to her to be ready in case we needed to bail and roll out. He didn't hear me though, because the wind was roaring in through one of the busted windows, adding to the charm of this sketchy ride. At some point, he made a weird comment about how romantic we looked together and said he missed being young. Real creepy vibes. A few minutes later, we pulled up to his place. He hadn't lied about the house. The neighborhood wasn't bad, and the house itself was bigger than I'd expected. A single-story ranch. But something was off. I mentioned the bars on the windows and the multiple deadbolts on the door. He brushed it off, saying his collection was precious and he had to keep it safe from potential thieves. As soon as he opened the door, I made sure to shuffle him inside first so there wouldn't be a chance to lock us in. Right away, three things hit us. His so-called art, his bizarre collection, and the smell. Oh, the smell. His version of art? Horrifying. He'd taken innocent things, baby dolls, stuffed animals, ceramic trinkets, and twisted them into something straight out of a nightmare. One that sticks with me was his unicorn. It used to be a simple ceramic horse, but he'd chopped the head off and replaced it with a baby doll's head, then stuck a poorly sculpted clay penis where the horn should be. Then there was his collection, which was no less unsettling. The place was crammed with latex outfits, rubber masks, and old gas masks. His so-called art and this collection were everywhere, filling up every single corner. You couldn't move without stepping on some creepy fetish gear or bumping into one of his grotesque creations. And man, the smell. It was like mold, mildew, and old rubber had merged into one awful stench. Cleanliness clearly wasn't something this guy cared about. The carpet looked like it hadn't been cleaned since the early 80s, thick with dust and grime. As we walked through the kitchen, he suddenly announced how much he loved cast iron skillets, because apparently, you never really have to wash them. I looked around and saw why. Every counter was covered with rusted pans, all caked with layers of burnt food from God knows when. We kept quiet, staying close behind him as he led us through his hoarded maze, stopping every few feet to point out his art and remind us, again and again, that the room was packed with his best pieces, but he'd move them out once we were ready to move in. It was as if he was sure we were already committed. Eventually, we reached the room. He opened the door with a dramatic, ta-da, as if he were unveiling something impressive. The space probably was around 500 square feet, but it felt tiny with the sheer amount of stuff crammed inside. Clothing racks filled every inch, and all the racks were hung with the same bizarre items. Latex, plastic, and rubber pants, each with some sort of enhancement sewn to the front. It was like a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. Up until that moment, we had been trying our best not to react to all the weird things in his house. We were scared that if we showed any discomfort, he might freak out on us. But I started to notice that he seemed almost disappointed. It was as if he wanted us to react, to be shocked by his creepy art. My guess was that he got some twisted enjoyment out of it. And since we were keeping calm, things weren't going the way he wanted. We told him the room looked big enough and that we'd think it over and let him know after heading back to the hotel. He didn't react much, just nodded and agreed to drive us back. But as we walked through the hallway, I noticed something strange. When he thought we weren't looking, he pulled something out of his pocket and quickly tossed it into a dark room as we passed by. I got a bad feeling, so I used the light from my phone to peek into the room as we moved past it. I wish I hadn't. Inside, the floor was covered with tied-off used condoms, piles of them. My girlfriend called them sperm balloons later when we talked about it. 
We figured he must have been doing something in the restaurant bathroom and added one to the pile before taking us back to his place. The drive back was tense to say the least. He was rambling again, but this time with more frustration in his voice. He seemed agitated, probably because we hadn't reacted the way he expected. Twice, he drove right past where we'd asked him to drop us off. By the third time, we didn't wait for him to stop. As soon as the truck hit a red light, we jumped out, babbling quick goodbyes and thanking him before bolting. I saved his number under creepy pants in my phone. Over the next few days, he texted a couple of times asking if we'd made a decision. I didn't want to be rude, so I replied politely, saying we'd decided against it but appreciated his offer. His response? Are you creeped yet? Pasted over and over, probably about 30 times in a row. For some reason, I still tried to keep things civil. After he stopped spamming, I sent him one last message. No, we thought your collection was nice, but it's just too much stuff for us to ask you to move. He didn't reply for a few days, but when he did, it was surprisingly chill. Yeah, didn't really want to move it. Thanks for understanding. He even recommended a local burger joint, which made zero sense. I blocked his number after that, just in case. I'm sitting in this tiny airport, waiting to board my flight. I'm done with this place and won't ever be back. Don't get me wrong, Mexico is stunning and the food alone is worth the trip. I'm a big food lover, always hunting for new dishes. But this visit? It's been a nightmare, all thanks to the Airbnb my wife and I chose. We were only planning to stay for a few days, so instead of a regular hotel, we opted for something more local. I was browsing Airbnb one evening, scrolling past listings, when I came across something truly special. Hey Sarah, come check this out, I called over to my wife. What is it? She asked, walking over. I showed her the photos. The house was this charming old-fashioned place, looked like it had history. It wasn't being lived in at the moment, only rented out on Airbnb. It's beautiful, but why is it so cheap? She asked, raising an eyebrow. I don't know, maybe because it's kind of old? I shrugged. Honestly, I didn't care why it was cheap. The place looked fantastic. We booked it without a second thought. The owner confirmed right away with an auto reply, and just like that, our trip was set. A couple of days later we landed in Mexico, grabbed a cab, and headed straight to the house. If we thought the photos were nice, the real thing was even better. The place was massive, with a lush garden wrapping around it. Stepping inside was like walking into a dream. Everything was pristine and the air smelled like fresh herbs. The owner was waiting for us. He was this older man, maybe in his 60s, with a crooked smile and eyes that never quite lined up right. He gave us a quick tour, explaining things in broken English. I caught bits and pieces, but most of it went over my head. Afterward, he mumbled something about needing to run some errands and shuffled out the door. Once we were alone, Sarah turned to me, her eyes wide. This place is amazing. I can't believe we got it for the price. I know, right? I laughed. Feel like checking out the bedroom again? The bedroom was the highlight. High wooden ceilings and a bed that looked big enough to get lost in. After the long flight, we were both wiped out, so it wasn't long before we decided to crash. We slipped into the enormous bed, and within minutes, Sarah was out cold, snoring softly beside me. I grabbed a book off the nightstand, trying to wind down before sleep. It must have been maybe half an hour before I noticed the first sound. A light scratching, like something scuttling across the roof. I brushed it off at first, figuring it was just a stray cat or something. But the sound wouldn't stop. After a few more minutes, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Sighing, I threw back the blankets and got up to check it out. I opened the window, leaning out into the night. The air was still, but nothing seemed out of place. There was no movement, no sound beyond the usual hum of a quiet neighborhood. I shut the window and climbed back into bed, convincing myself it was nothing. Just before I drifted off, I glanced at my phone. It was only 7 p.m. The next thing I knew, I was jolted awake by a loud crash from downstairs. It was like something had fallen or been knocked over. My heart jumped, and I sat up quickly, realizing Sarah had woken up too her eyes wide with alarm. Did you hear that? I whispered. Yeah, she breathed. 
What was that? Stay here, I'll check it out, I said, but she was already getting out of bed. No way, I'm coming with you. We grabbed our phones for light since the house was completely dark. Sarah shone hers ahead as we moved toward the door. I noticed something strange as the glow from her screen caught my eye. The clock on her phone. Something wasn't right. Hey, did you reset your phone to the local time when we got here? I asked, frowning. Yeah, why? She replied, glancing down at the screen. Your phone says it's 8 a.m., I said slowly. She stopped and looked closer at the time, her brow furrowed. I found myself staring at the window, half expecting to see sunlight streaming in. But outside was nothing but darkness, the same as when we'd gone to bed. That's so weird, she mumbled. Maybe the time changed overnight. But we went to bed at 7 p.m., I said, feeling a creeping unease settle in. Something wasn't adding up. Without thinking, I walked over to the window and tried to open it like I had earlier. But this time, the window wouldn't budge. I tugged harder, but it was sealed shut. That's when I realized there were boards nailed over it from the outside. I turned to Sarah, and the look on her face told me she'd noticed it too. Let's check the front door, I suggested. Maybe there's some kind of maintenance going on. We hurried downstairs, moving quickly through the dark house. When we reached the front door, my stomach dropped. It was also boarded up from the outside. All thoughts of the crash we'd heard earlier vanished as a new wave of fear washed over me. And then, just like before, the scratching sound returned. This time, louder, coming from above. Something was still up there. But this time, the noise wasn't coming from the roof. It was coming from the bedroom we had just left. I aimed my phone's light up the staircase, trying to see through the darkness. That's when I saw it. Two enormous glowing yellow eyes staring back at me. A long, forked tongue flicked out, tasting the air. Coiled on the stairs was a massive body, easily filling the entire space. A snake, huge, blocking our way out. Neither of us could move. We stood there, frozen, our brains scrambling to catch up with what we were seeing. Then, the snake began to slither, slowly making its way down toward us, its scales scraping against the steps. Run! Sarah yelled, her voice cracking with panic. Without thinking, we bolted in opposite directions. I sprinted toward the kitchen, hoping to find something, anything I could use to defend myself. But when I reached the drawers, I realized they were all empty. Not a single knife or sharp object. It was like someone had cleared everything out. Then I heard it, screams from the other room. Sarah. Her voice was filled with pure terror, echoing through the house. Help! Somebody help! My heart pounded in my chest, and without thinking, I ran back toward her, the fear driving me. The screams cut off abruptly as I reached the door. I kicked it open, shining my light into the room. What I saw stopped me cold. There on the floor was Sarah's body, limp and lifeless, and wrapped tightly around her was that snake. Its massive coils constricted her, squeezing the life out of her. I couldn't breathe. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. My mind went blank. Then, the snake turned its head toward me, its tongue flicking out, and it hissed, exposing its fangs. My body snapped into action. I turned and ran, tearing up the stairs as fast as my legs could carry me. Behind me, I could hear the snake slithering faster, the sound of its body dragging against the floor getting closer and closer. I reached the bedroom and slammed the door shut, pushing a chair against it to barricade myself in. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely move. That's when I noticed the attic door in the corner of the room. I hadn't seen it before. I rushed over, throwing it open. There was a faint light coming from the other side. I didn't care where it led, as long as it wasn't here. I scrambled through the opening, crawling toward the light until I found myself on the roof. I had no idea how I made it out, but it didn't matter. I was alive. I stumbled to the rental car, my hands shaking as I started the engine and sped off toward the police station. I glanced in the rearview mirror, and there he was, the old man. Standing in front of the house, smiling that crooked smile, he waved at me as if nothing had happened. When I finally reached the police, 
They didn't believe a word I said. They claimed they'd inspected the house and found everything in order. They refused to take any further action. But I know what I saw. I came to that house with my wife. And I know that now, I'm leaving it alone. My partner and I moved into a small apartment in early 2020, right after we learned we were expecting our first child. Before that, we'd been living in a rundown neighborhood for about six months. Nothing too dramatic happened there, but I never liked the area. I grew up hearing that the city was rough, and the stories stuck with me. When I found out I was pregnant, I knew I wanted out. We ended up in a different city, in a place I knew well because one of my cousins used to live there. Our new home was on the top floor, which I wasn't thrilled about, but it was the only two-bedroom that was open at the time. The first year passed without a hitch. I had the baby, and we were settling into this new routine as parents. I can't pinpoint exactly when we met the guy across the hall. His name was Mark, not a fake name because I don't care if anyone knows who he is. He was in his late 50s, living with his sister, which I found a bit odd. From the start, Something about him just felt... wrong. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I told my partner early on that something was off about Mark. My partner would ask why, and I struggled to explain. It wasn't that he was rude or anything like that. It was more subtle, like he was trying to hide who he really was, and that's what made it worse. As time passed, I started picking up on little things about him. Mark was the kind of guy who seemed friendly with everyone, but there was a pattern to it. He mostly focused on younger women, women around my age, early 30s, or younger. And whenever he talked to them, it went on forever. Almost like he was purposely making it hard to walk away without feeling like you were being rude. I ended up in this situation more than once, and every single time, it was so uncomfortable. It wasn't about what he said exactly. It was how he always managed to put himself in just the right spot to make things awkward. For instance, He'd block the laundry room door, so I'd have no way out unless I cut him off mid-sentence, which would seem impolite. Or he'd suddenly appear in the hallway right when I was leaving with my kid, like he was just waiting. Sometimes he'd catch my partner coming home from work, starting a chat in the hall, which seemed innocent enough, but then he'd push it further. There were moments when he'd just follow my partner inside our place, continuing the conversation as if it was no big deal. I was furious when this happened. I remember shooting my partner a look, hoping he'd notice and find a way to stop it. But somehow, Mark made it feel like it would have been rude to ask him to leave. Looking back, I should have done something. Yelled at him. Told him to get out. I mean, seriously. Who does that? Who walks into someone's home without an invite? Things finally hit a breaking point about a month before we were set to move. The management had changed hands, and we weren't sure how much the rent was going to go up. But honestly, I just wanted out. Away from Mark. It had gotten to the point where I would check the peephole before stepping out, just to avoid running into him. On this particular day, I was getting ready for work, still in my bathrobe, when there was a knock at the door. I dreaded it but went to check, and sure enough, it was Mark. Without waiting for an invitation, he barged in, again. Thankfully, my partner was home this time, or I would have been beyond uncomfortable. Mark said he needed our help, and when we asked what was going on, he started talking about some woman he'd been chatting with online. Apparently, she had been asking him for money, and when he told her he was out of cash, she threatened to post certain pictures of him on Facebook for his family to see. And yeah, it was exactly the kind of pictures you're thinking of. We were stunned, not just by the fact that this was happening to him, but also because we couldn't figure out why he thought we were the ones to help. It was pretty obvious this was a scam. I mean, if his family saw those pictures, they'd probably just think the woman was out of her mind. I told him straight up to block her and never talk to her again. Mark, though, acted all confused, saying he didn't know how to block people and handed me his phone. Big mistake. The first thing I saw, a part of Mark I never wanted, or needed, to see. Ever. But that wasn't even the worst part. As I scrolled up, my stomach dropped. The girl he was chatting with looked way too young, like she could still be in high school. Furious, I showed my partner the messages. He was just as shocked, 
and immediately asked Mark how old the girl was. You could see it on his face. He got nervous right away. And that told us everything we needed to know. His answer? Oh, I thought she looked about 30. Yeah, right. The dude was old enough to have a daughter that age, but the way he said it made it clear he probably knew the truth and just didn't want to admit it. At this point, I really needed to finish getting ready for work. So I headed to the bedroom to change while my partner stayed and kept talking to Mark. I overheard him trying to explain to Mark that he needed to be careful online and that what he was doing could lead to serious trouble. It seemed like my partner was trying to hold on to some sliver of hope that Mark wasn't actually talking to a teenage girl. He even gave him this long-winded lecture about how a lot of adult content on the internet isn't actually what it seems and that it's dangerous to trust what's out there. Then, Mark said something that made my skin crawl. So, does that mean I should get rid of the stuff in my room? I didn't even want to know what he was referring to. Honestly, I was tempted to report him to the police, thinking he could be some kind of predator. But the truth was, I didn't have solid proof the girl was underage. And with how the police usually handled internet stuff like this, I doubted they'd do much. We had dealt with online scams before, and when we tried to report them, the police just shrugged it off, saying there wasn't much they could do. Sorry for rambling, but that day confirmed every gut feeling I had during those three years we lived there. I'm beyond relieved that we've moved and haven't had to deal with Mark since. Maybe he wasn't a full-on predator, but he was definitely a creep, and I'll never let my daughter be anywhere near him. You can't be too careful these days. As I left school that afternoon, I couldn't stop smiling. Turning 11 made me feel unstoppable, like anything could happen. Birthdays when you're young just have this magic, you know? You've got all your loved ones around, the thrill of new presents, and that rush of excitement knowing something great is waiting for you at home. I ran straight for my mom's car, eager to get back and start celebrating. My family has this silly rule though, no opening gifts until after school or work. Even though I hated it, I was still buzzing, imagining all the surprises waiting for me. My parents always made sure my birthday was special, and I couldn't wait to see what they had planned this year. For months I'd been dropping little hints about what I wanted. A treehouse. It was all I could think about, having a secret place of my own tucked up high in the trees. So when we finally pulled into the driveway and I saw my dad waiting outside grinning, I had a feeling today was going to be the best. I jumped out of the car and gave him a hug. Happy birthday, buddy, he said, ruffling my hair. That's when I noticed a big, colorful package sitting on the porch, and I rushed over to it. My hands tore through the wrapping paper so fast I barely noticed what I was doing. Inside was a shiny new set of tools. Now you can help me build that treehouse you've been dreaming about, my dad said, winking at me. My heart practically stopped. My dad was going to build me a treehouse. I'd always admired how handy he was, but I never thought he'd make something just for me. It was like a dream come true, especially at that age. The next few weeks were all about working on the treehouse. Dad showed me how to use the tools, letting me hammer nails and paint the boards. It wasn't always easy, and sometimes I'd throw a fit when things didn't go my way. But looking back, those were some of the best moments of my life. Mom would bring us snacks, and my little brother would sit nearby, watching us, clearly wishing he was old enough to help. After what felt like ages, the treehouse was done. It was tiny, much smaller than I remember, but at the time, it seemed huge. We had a slide, a little swing, and a ladder leading up to a balcony. It even had a rope ladder we could pull up at night to keep out any intruders. I couldn't wait for that first night in the treehouse with my dad. We lugged our sleeping bags and blankets up to the treehouse, and just when I thought it couldn't get any better, my dad pulled out a small flashlight for us to hang inside. As we laid there, staring through the branches at the sky, I felt like the luckiest kid on the planet. I couldn't believe this incredible hideaway was really mine. My dad and I stayed up late, talking about all the fun we'd have in our new little fort, all the games we'd play, and the adventures we'd go on together. From that night on, I was completely hooked. My treehouse became my sanctuary. I spent all my spare time up there, imagining I was a pirate captain or a fearless explorer. My friends would come over, and we'd have picnics, play hide-and-seek, 
or just hang out in our secret spot. It was my escape, a place where the outside world didn't matter. But as the years passed, my love for treehouses got a little... out of hand. I started spending hours online, scrolling through pictures of these crazy, fancy treehouses people built for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'd get lost daydreaming about building my own one day, something massive like an actual home in the trees. I kept pestering my dad to add on to ours. The tree it was built in was huge, and I kept thinking we could expand, maybe even turn it into a whole treehouse village. I even started drawing up detailed plans, blueprints that I was sure could work if we just put in the time. My parents began to worry, thinking I was taking it all a bit too far. But I didn't care. To me, treehouses were magical, and I couldn't understand why anyone wouldn't want one. By the time I hit my teenage years, my obsession had only grown stronger. I'd lock myself in my room for hours, sketching out new designs and coming up with even bigger, more elaborate ideas, all while ignoring my homework. My parents tried to get me to focus on other things, but I was too wrapped up in my plans. I couldn't let go of the dream of living in a treehouse someday. That dream started to slip away once I went off to college. Between classes and trying to make new friends, I didn't have time to think about treehouses. I wasn't even home to hang out in mine. Slowly, without really noticing, I let the obsession fade into the background as life took over. It wasn't until I graduated and moved back home that I finally saw my old treehouse again. It looked a little rough, weathered from years of being out in the elements, and seeing it like that hit me harder than I expected. That treehouse had been everything to me growing up. I realized then that my obsession wasn't really about treehouses themselves. It was about holding on to the simple, carefree days of being a kid. Looking at it now, I see how much those years shaped me. The time I spent building and dreaming with my dad. Those are the memories I'll treasure forever. It was more than just a treehouse. It was a symbol of our bond and the joy we shared together. Even if I never live in one, treehouses will always have a special place in my heart for all the happiness they brought me. Now, ten years later, my dad bursts into my room, all excited about a treehouse Airbnb he found online. I roll my eyes, not really in the mood to hear about one of his wild ideas. What is it now, dad? I groaned pulling myself away from my computer. He stood there with his phone in hand, eyes lit up with excitement. I found the perfect spot for our next vacation, he exclaimed, waving his phone in front of me. I sighed, knowing full well that once my dad got an idea into his head, there was no stopping him. All right, let's see, I said, grabbing the phone. As I scrolled through the pictures of the Airbnb, I had to admit, it looked pretty impressive. Way better than the treehouse we had in our backyard years ago. Nestled deep within a thick forest, this treehouse was something straight out of a storybook. Surrounded by towering trees, lush greenery, and even a quaint little wooden bridge leading up to it, it was magical. Okay, this is actually kind of cool, I said, handing the phone back. Dad beamed, already diving into full-on vacation planning mode. By the time I hit my early teens, my fascination with treehouses started to fade, just like everything else I used to love as a kid. I could tell it bummed my parents out a bit, especially Dad. It was like the part of me he connected with the most had disappeared. So I could see why he was so excited about this trip. It was like a chance to relive those old memories. A few weeks later, our family of five packed up the car, ready for the treehouse getaway. My younger siblings, Jake and Lily, could barely contain themselves, bouncing around the back seat. Mom was busy trying to keep them from going wild. Meanwhile, I was caught between feeling excited and, honestly, a bit uneasy. I still love treehouses, but after a creepy experience in one a few years back, I wasn't as thrilled as I thought I'd be. As we pulled up to the treehouse, my heart raced. It was even more incredible than the pictures showed with fairy lights twinkling along the edges and lanterns swaying gently from the wooden beams. The little bridge was straight up adorable. Our host, a friendly older guy, greeted us with a tour and a quick rundown of the house rules. Always keep the doors closed, he warned with a serious look. We don't want any uninvited guests. His words sent a shiver down my spine, 
reminding me of that one night in my childhood treehouse when I had to deal with a rat problem. I pushed the memory aside, trying to convince myself that this place was clean, well-maintained, and far from those rat-infested nightmares. As we settled in, a wave of nostalgia hit me hard. The treehouse brought back all those memories of being a kid, spending hours up in my own little world. A part of me missed it. How simple and carefree life used to be. Now, here I was, back in a treehouse, only this time I wasn't a kid anymore, but I still felt that old familiar excitement bubbling up, even if it was tinged with a bit of unease. That night, we all gathered around the outdoor fire pit, roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. Dad got into a story about his childhood treehouse and how he would spend hours pretending to be anything from a pirate to a secret agent. Listening to him, I couldn't help but smile, picturing a younger version of him, full of wild imagination, just like me when I was a kid. As the night dragged on, we eventually turned in, the treehouse creaking softly in the breeze. But as I lay in my sleeping bag, something didn't feel right. I kept tossing and turning, unable to shake the weird feeling in my gut. The rustling of leaves outside, the occasional snap of a twig, it all seemed too loud, too close. I couldn't sleep. I keep telling myself it's just the wind rustling the leaves, but the sound keeps creeping closer, getting louder. Just as I feel myself drifting off, a sharp scratching noise slices through the quiet night. My heart skips a beat, and suddenly, my imagination runs wild. Every nightmare creature I've ever thought of must be outside, trying to claw its way into the treehouse. I try to shake my family awake, but they're all completely knocked out, not hearing a thing. I'm stuck, frozen in fear, as the scratching keeps going, scraping at my nerves. Then, out of nowhere, I hear a soft thud followed by a faint squeak. My first thought? Rats. My stomach twists, and before I can stop myself, I scream. Everyone jolts awake, startled and groggy. What's wrong? Mom asks, rubbing her eyes, trying to wake up. I heard something outside. I think it's rats, I blurt, my voice shaking. My heart is pounding so hard I feel like it might burst. Dad, still half asleep, gets up and checks outside. He comes back with a puzzled look, shaking his head. There's nothing out there, kiddo, he says, trying to calm me down. Embarrassed, I bury my face in my hands, feeling like a complete idiot for freaking out. But just as I'm about to relax, I hear it again. Scratch. Thud. Scratch. My chest tightens, and I can't hold back the tears anymore. Something is definitely out there. Dad grabs a flashlight this time, determined to find out what's making the noise. We all crowd around as he shines the light outside. And then we see them. A bunch of squirrels slipping through a tiny gap at the bottom of the treehouse. Relief washes over us, and we all laugh, shaking our heads at how ridiculous we were, thinking it was rats. Dad grabs a plank of wood, patches up the hole, and the squirrels scamper off into the night. Finally, we all settle back down, this time with giggles instead of fear. The tension breaks, and sleep comes easier. The next morning, the sound of birds chirping wakes me up sunlight filtering through the treehouse windows. I feel a little foolish about my panic last night, but my family reassures me there's no need to feel bad. We all laugh about it over breakfast, and I feel lighter, the fear of last night fading away. We spend the day exploring the forest, climbing trees, and soaking up the quiet peace of the place. My old love for treehouses starts creeping back. I remember why I spent hours in my childhood treehouse, it wasn't just about the wood and nails. It was the memories, the sense of adventure, and the feeling of being surrounded by something bigger than myself. As our last day winds down and we start packing up to leave, a bittersweet feeling settles in. This trip had been everything I didn't know I needed, a reminder that fear is often just in our heads, and the things we're scared of rarely turn out to be as bad as we imagine. On our way out, we wave goodbye to the host and drive away. I keep thinking about those squirrels sneaking their way into our sanctuary. It's a small reminder that no matter how much we build to keep nature out, it always finds a way back in. A couple of weeks later, I'm sitting in my room scrolling through Airbnb again. I stumble across another listing, 
a treehouse, this time deep in a redwood forest. I can't help but grin. Even after everything, my love for treehouses hasn't faded. I know I won't hesitate to book the next one I find. Treehouses will always hold a special place in my heart, a link to my past, and a reminder of the magic they've brought into my life. I was on my own, driving through the back roads of Idaho. The night had settled in, and the road was swallowed by the vast fields. It was my first time taking a solo trip, heading to a remote cabin I found on Airbnb. The idea of staying out in the middle of nowhere had sounded appealing at first. Just me and nature, no distractions, far from the noise of the city. I'd always been used to the busy streets, the constant hum of city life, so when I saw the listing for a quiet farm stay, I booked it for the weekend right away. The pictures of the place made it look peaceful and cozy, a perfect escape from everything. Just a few days to unwind. But as I drove further into the night, that initial excitement started to fade replaced by an uneasy feeling that crept up slowly. I'd been on the road for hours, way past when I'd planned to get there. The narrow path was surrounded by trees so thick that they blotted out any moonlight. My GPS had cut out miles back, and there was no phone signal. Still, I tried to remind myself that I was following the instructions the host had emailed, step by step, lane after lane, turn after turn. Everything was supposed to be fine. Just when I began to feel a little calmer, like maybe the darkness wasn't so bad, my headlights flickered. It was quick, but enough to make my stomach drop. Then, just like that, they went out. I slammed the brakes, pulling the car to the side. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it might burst. I checked the headlights, but they weren't broken. They had just stopped working, like something had shut them off. I tried to calm down, telling myself it had to be a technical problem, maybe a wiring issue. But being stuck out there, with no light, no idea where I was, my mind was starting to go places it shouldn't. I shut off the engine, hoping a quick restart would bring the lights back on. But when I twisted the key, nothing changed. The headlights stayed dead. Now I was stuck. No lights, no idea where I was going, and, of course, no signal. My brain went into overdrive, playing out all kinds of bad scenarios. Maybe someone had messed with my car. A guy at the garage had fixed my engine a couple of months ago. Could he have done something shady? I was just about to step out and pop the hood when I saw it. A figure, standing right in the middle of the road, not moving. My heart jumped into my throat. My first instinct was to lock the doors, hands shaking as I fumbled for the handle. What was this? Who was this? It didn't matter. I wasn't taking any chances. I scrambled into the back seat, curling up as small as I could, trying to blend into the shadows of my own car. I silently begged for the night to end, for the sun to rise and burn away the darkness, along with whatever, or whoever, was out there. Minutes dragged on, each one making my fear grow. I thought about trying the engine again, but without lights, I'd be driving blind. Desperate, I grabbed my phone, turning on the flashlight and holding it up to the windshield. But all it did was reflect back into my face, making me feel even more trapped. I had no idea if that figure was still standing out there, but I couldn't bring myself to check. Instead, I stayed huddled in the back, trembling, waiting for morning. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the first bit of light broke through the trees. I hesitated, then peeked outside. The road was empty. Whoever, or whatever, I saw was gone. I forced myself to get out, checking the headlights one last time, but they still didn't work. Something was seriously wrong with the car. Shaken but determined to get out of there, I drove toward the Airbnb. As the landmarks I passed last night came into view, I felt a wave of relief. When I reached the farmhouse, I was greeted by a peaceful scene, fields stretching far, a quiet pond out front, three frogs sitting by the water. I grabbed my phone to check my messages and saw over a dozen missed calls from the Airbnb host, wondering why I hadn't arrived yet. The host, an older guy named Dave, greeted me when I finally arrived. I told him about my night, and he apologized for the roads being so dark, explaining that the area didn't have any streetlights, or really any lights at all. 
He casually mentioned that a few people had claimed to see strange figures walking around that same road at night. He suggested I stay indoors after dark and only leave in the morning when it was bright out. I was glad to have made it in one piece, but the fear from last night hadn't left me. I was running on no sleep, with dark circles under my eyes. Dave must have thought I was a mess, but he didn't say anything. Over the next few days, I wandered the farmlands, strolled by the little pond, and soaked in the quiet of the countryside. It was peaceful, but every night, once it got dark, I couldn't shake that creeping feeling of dread. On my last evening I worked up the courage to ask Dave about what I'd seen on the road. I explained how I saw someone standing there, motionless. He listened carefully and then shared a story. Years ago, a woman had died in a car accident on that very road. She had been driving alone late at night, lost control, and crashed into a tree. Since then, neighbors had often spotted her ghost between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., wandering along the roadside. I didn't know what to think. Could I really have seen the spirit of that woman? The idea clung to me, unsettling as it was, all the way home. My mind kept replaying the past few days, the mix of excitement, fear, relief, and above all, confusion. One thing was for sure. I learned never to go on a long road trip without making sure my car was in good shape. I had no clue about fixing cars, but at least I could take it to a shop and have it checked. When I did, the mechanic found an issue with the electrical system. It cost me about 40 bucks to fix, since most of it was still under warranty. I never expected my quiet getaway in Idaho to turn into such a bizarre experience. Lying in the back seat that night, I was convinced my car windows were going to shatter, and I'd be dragged into the woods by some stranger. But instead, I might have seen a ghost. Whether you believe it or not, that's up to you. But honestly, I'd rather have seen the ghost of that girl than some real person lurking in the dark. A few weeks back, I rented this secluded cabin through an Airbnb listing. I was gearing up for a hiking trip with a couple of friends, and this spot was meant to be my base for two nights before we'd head out for the rest of the journey. When I arrived, the cabin seemed perfect, tucked away in the woods, just as the listing described. I parked the car around the side, grabbed my bags, and went inside. The place was small, nothing fancy, but cozy enough for the price I paid. That first night, I hit the bed pretty fast, exhausted from the drive, and woke up early the next day. I planned to scout out part of the trail we'd start on, making sure the path was still good after last week's rain. The goal was to see if it was muddy or blocked, so I could make backup plans if needed. I spent the morning lazily sipping on coffee, waiting until the afternoon to finally head out. The trailhead wasn't far, just a half mile down the main road, so I decided to walk. The path seemed clear enough after just a short walk, so I didn't bother going too far, and headed back to the cabin. I'd barely been gone for an hour when I noticed something weird on my way back. From a distance I saw a truck parked in front of the cabin. I sped up, my heart racing a bit. When I got there, I checked the truck. No one was inside. I looked around but didn't see a single person. The place was eerily quiet. My gut twisted as I checked the front door, but it was still locked. Inside, everything was as I left it. No sign anyone had been here at all. Feeling uneasy, I messaged the Airbnb host through the app, asking if anyone else had permission to be here or if he knew about the truck. As I waited for a reply, I double-checked the windows, still not seeing any movement outside. What made the situation even creepier was the isolation. The cabin was completely surrounded by thick forest, with no obvious place for someone to disappear to. There were no other houses nearby, no trails or roads, just trees as far as the eye could see. I kept checking my phone, waiting for the host to reply. Hours dragged on, and the sunlight started to fade. Still, no one came back for the truck. Finally, around 8 p.m., I got a message back. No one else should be there. I wasn't exactly surprised by that, but I had been clinging to the hope that maybe there was a simple explanation. With that confirmation, though, I knew I couldn't stay. I didn't feel safe anymore. I decided to pack up my stuff and leave, but as I started gathering my things, I heard footsteps on the porch. I froze. 
They were slow and heavy, coming right up to the door. No knock followed. I waited, barely breathing, staring at the door, expecting something to happen. After what felt like forever, I tiptoed up to the front window and peeked out. There was a man standing on the porch, tall and still, facing away from the door. He wasn't moving, just standing there, staring at the truck. The whole scene felt wrong, like he wasn't supposed to be there. My chest tightened with dread, and I instinctively backed away from the door, keeping my steps quiet. I knew I needed to call for help, but on my third step back, the floor betrayed me. The old wood groaned loudly under my foot. Immediately the man outside stirred. I saw his body jerk, then the doorknob rattled violently as he tried to force his way in. My heart jumped into my throat. I bolted into the bedroom, slamming the door and locking it behind me. I fumbled for my phone, quickly dialing 911 while the man outside banged on the door, his fists pounding against the wood. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, the noise stopped. A few seconds later, I heard the truck's engine roar to life, and it peeled away into the darkness. The police got there fairly quickly, but they didn't find much. No sign of the man, and no clues to where he went. They didn't seem too concerned. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had almost happened. I packed up the rest of my stuff and left that night, booking a hotel in town instead. The man was still out there somewhere and the thought of what he might have been planning terrified me. Even now, I can't stop thinking about it. Where had he been before I saw him? Was he lurking in the woods while I walked back, watching me? Or had he been hiding closer, maybe even near the cabin the whole time? After that night, I don't think I'll be staying in another remote cabin anytime soon. The thought of it still sends chills down my spine. For some context, I'm in my last year of college and live off campus with two of my closest friends. Around Thanksgiving, they always try to keep me distracted since this time of year is usually tough for me. My mom took off right before Thanksgiving when I was nine, and my dad passed away six years ago on November 23rd. So yeah, if I don't stay busy, it's easy for me to sink into a bad mood during this time. For the past few years, I've been going to one of my friends' homes to spend Thanksgiving with their families. But last year, I decided to stay home and enjoy a quiet, extended weekend. I thought I'd catch up on some personal stuff and maybe knock out some school assignments since I was falling behind. We don't live super close to campus. It's a 20 to 25 minute drive from where we stay, in a small town just outside the city. The distance was kind of nice because it meant we never had to throw any parties at our place. We could just head to the ones near campus and then come back home afterward. There was this one house on our street that always felt out of place. It wasn't run down or anything, but there were no plants, and it badly needed a new coat of paint. We knew the guy who lived there since he introduced himself when we moved in a few years ago. His name's Jake. He's short, like 5'5", and super skinny, probably not even 100 pounds when wet. Every time we've talked, he's been friendly and helpful. He even fixed our porch light when it broke last summer. He's always polite, helping people around the neighborhood with small repairs and stuff like that. On the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, my two roommates went back to their hometowns to spend the holiday with their families. They both asked me over and over if I was absolutely sure I wanted to spend the weekend by myself, making sure I'd be okay alone. I really believed I'd be fine. I figured enough years had gone by, and I could just focus on keeping myself busy without thinking about the past too much. I stocked up on Red Bull to keep myself awake after working on some papers, planning to unwind with my Xbox afterward. Around 8 or 9 p.m., I headed to my room to put on some sweatpants and grab the cozy blanket from my bed. When I looked out my window, I saw Jake sitting on his porch, both of his outside lights on. I didn't think much of it, just a neighbor hanging out on his porch at night. So I went downstairs to the kitchen and made myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I spent maybe 10 minutes eating and cleaning up a couple of dishes. When I finally plopped down on the couch to start my game, I heard something hit the big window at the front of the house. It was faint, but loud enough to make me curious, so I got up to check. At first, I didn't spot anything, but then I noticed Jake had turned off his porch lights and was now standing on his lawn, 
staring at our place. His head was tilted slightly upward like he was looking at one of the upstairs windows. Feeling uneasy, I tried to call a friend who I knew was still in town. I thought maybe she could come over and keep me company, but she didn't pick up. I sat on the couch for a while, thinking about what I should do. Every time I peeked out the window, Jake seemed to inch a little closer to our yard. He was still just standing there, staring. I didn't know how to handle it. I mean, what could I tell the cops? He hadn't actually done anything, just creeped me out a bit. And technically, he wasn't even on our property yet. yet. A few minutes later, I glanced out again, and this time, Jake was standing on our lawn. He was just looking at the side of the house. At least, that's what it seemed like. By now, I was getting seriously freaked out. I thought maybe I was overreacting, but at the same time, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I grabbed my phone, keys, and a few other things, figuring I'd just head to campus. Maybe the student center or library would still be open, even though it was the holiday break. I decided to keep all the lights on, trying to make it look like I wasn't about to leave. My plan was to quietly slip out through the back door without being seen. As I crept through the yard and rounded the corner to head to my car, I nearly froze. Jake was standing right there in our driveway. Startled, I asked him what he was doing, but he just put a finger to his lips, making a shh sound. Without even thinking, I slapped him hard and bolted, running past my car as fast as I could. My heart was pounding, adrenaline telling me to keep running until I found help, or at least felt safe. I made it a few blocks away when I noticed a bunch of cop cars speeding toward my street. Confused and out of breath, I hesitated before turning back toward my house. I thought maybe one of the neighbors had seen Jake lurking around and called the cops. When I got closer, an officer stopped me, asking if I lived at the house. I confirmed it, still trying to catch my breath. What he said next was the most chilling thing I've ever heard. Jake had called them. He told the cops that while he was sitting on his porch, he saw me upstairs, walking out of my bedroom. But after I left the room, Jake said he saw someone else step out of my closet. Apparently, that was why Jake was staring so intently at my house earlier. He wasn't watching me. He was watching this guy in my room. When I saw him looking toward the corner of the house, he was actually trying to track the intruder, who was moving toward my roommate's room. The last time I saw Jake in the yard, just before I slapped him and ran, the intruder had already made it downstairs. Jake was staying quiet, terrified of alerting the man inside the house. He knew the guy might be dangerous, so he didn't want to make a scene that would put either of us in more danger. Jake called the police the moment he realized what was happening, and did everything he could to keep the situation calm, without scaring me or alerting the intruder. The guy inside was arrested not long after. He didn't have much on him, just a knife so no one's sure if he was there to rob us or had something worse in mind. I couldn't thank Jake enough for what he did. Even after everything, he kept apologizing, saying he should have handled things differently, should have found a way to warn me sooner. But honestly, I was just grateful. Grateful that he'd noticed and acted before anything worse happened. Still, this whole thing has left a deep scar. Another horrible memory tied to this time of year. It's going to take a long time to get over this, but one thing's for sure. I will never spend Thanksgiving alone again. I'm a 25-year-old guy, and not too long ago, I used to work for a short-term rental company as part of their customer support team. You know the kind, where regular people rent out their houses or apartments to strangers, offering an alternative to hotels. It's a decent gig, but the whole thing sits in a legal gray area. There's no clear law protecting guests like you'd have if you signed a lease, for instance. So, if your host decides to cancel your stay, that's it. You're out, and if you don't leave, you could technically be charged with trespassing. It was kind of wild thinking about that, but that's how it worked. Anyway, right before this job, I crashed my car on a slick, icy road during a blizzard. My car slid right into a curb, messing up the suspension on the left side, so I had no choice but to start using public transport. Luckily, I lived close to a bus stop, and my office wasn't too far from another. The day after the accident, I called work to let them know I'd be late, and they were cool about it. 
When I got there, about an hour late, my supervisor stuck me between two chatty girls to try and calm them down, but, of course, it didn't work. The girl on my right, let's call her Sarah, didn't even acknowledge I was there. She just kept leaning forward, talking to the girl on my left, Emma. And Emma? She was just as bad, chatting like I was invisible. It made it nearly impossible to focus on the training. There was another girl too, Natalie, sitting just beyond Sarah. She tried joining their conversations, but they mostly ignored her. Honestly, her comments were awkward, like she was forcing herself into the conversation and didn't really understand what was going on. They probably thought she was annoying because of how she came off, and she kind of was. When we finally got a break, we started talking about relationships. Sarah was single but crushing hard on our trainer. Emma was engaged, and I was in a relationship with someone I'd liked since I was a kid, planning to propose soon. They were both way more excited about my proposal plans than I was, throwing out all these suggestions. As we stood in the lobby, laughing and chatting, Natalie interrupted us. I have a boyfriend too, she said, her voice cutting through the conversation. He's 30 and has his own house, drives a Corvette. Now, Natalie was only 22, and while no one cared about the age difference, the more she talked, the more it sounded like she was making him up. We weren't trying to grill her or anything, just asking basic stuff, but every answer she gave felt off. Well, he's married, she admitted after a bit but he's just waiting for his divorce to go through. Once it does, I'll be moving in with him. And she just kept going from there. I started feeling really uneasy as Susan kept going on about her so-called boyfriend. Every now and then, she'd look me over, like she was sizing me up or something, and then just keep talking like nothing happened. It was weird and made me uncomfortable in a way I couldn't quite explain. I've always believed that physical attraction plays some role in relationships, and even if I'd been single, I wasn't drawn to her in any way. But the way she kept glancing at me gave me the creeps. At the end of our training session, I was ready to head out, making my way to the bus stop through a couple of feet of snow. Emma offered me a ride since she knew I lived on her way. I was super grateful and offered to top off her gas as a way of saying thanks. Right then, Susan jumped in asking if she could also get a lift to the bus station near my apartment. Emma offered to drop her off at the station a bit further up the road, but Susan insisted on being dropped at the one near my place. I didn't think much of it at first, but looking back, it was a little weird how she insisted on being dropped at the stop so close to where I lived, when there was a much more convenient one for her. Emma dropped me off at the leasing office. I didn't want anyone from work to know exactly where I lived, just to keep things private. Afterward, my roommate and I decided to stay in for the night, opting to order some pizza instead of dealing with the snow outside. I was still feeling pretty down after losing my car in the accident, so a quiet night in with pizza sounded like the perfect plan. About 45 minutes later, we were still waiting for our food. It made sense that it was taking a bit longer with the roads being so bad. Finally, the delivery guy showed up with the pizza, but along with it, he handed me something else, a small letter. He said he found it sitting on our doormat when he got there. My first thought was that it might be a note from a neighbor, since we'd only moved into the place a few weeks earlier and hadn't met many people yet. But the moment I saw the envelope, I got a bad feeling. The letter was covered in little drawn-on hearts, and inside one of them were the initials S and J, with an arrow going through it. That's when my stomach dropped. How did Susan know where I lived? How did she even get the apartment number? I felt a cold chill creep up my spine as I ripped the letter to shreds and tossed it in the trash. In hindsight, I wish I had kept it because what happened next was something I didn't see coming. The next day at work, Susan came up to me, all smiles, and casually asked, Did you get the little gift I left for you yesterday? I could feel my heart sink. How did you find out where I live? I asked, trying to stay calm. She tilted her head acting all innocent and said, Oh, I just used my admin privileges to access the test profile you set up during training. I hope that's okay. My head was spinning. Uh, no, it's definitely not okay. What the hell is wrong with you? If you ever show up at my place again, I'm calling the cops, I shouted, my voice trembling with anger. 
I couldn't believe she'd gone that far, stalking me, invading my privacy, all while knowing I had a girlfriend I planned to propose to. For the next two weeks, Susan kept pushing her way into conversations whenever I was talking with Emma and Sarah. Every time, she'd steer the chat toward herself, babbling about her boyfriend and the wild sex they were supposedly having now that his divorce was finalized. Now, I'm not one to care about what other people do in their personal lives, but hearing every explicit detail at work was just too much. Our conversations weren't even about sex. We talked about relationships, sure, but she took it to a level that made everyone uncomfortable. The worst part was how she wouldn't leave me alone outside of these conversations. We used Google Hangouts for work communication since we weren't allowed to have our phones on us while on the floor. Too much sensitive customer info at risk. She started sending me constant messages. I'm really sorry, can you forgive me? And, I like you so much, I didn't know how to say it. Can we start over? I ignored her at first, but the messages only got weirder, more desperate. Eventually, I blocked her because I couldn't handle it anymore. But then things escalated. She started sending more intense, angry messages. Why don't you like me? Is it because I'm overweight? Just tell me what's wrong with me. Then the real disturbing ones came. I'd let you do anything you wanted to me. Just say the word. I'll come over. Followed by, I'll tell everyone you raped me if you don't let me come over tonight. That was the final straw. I blocked her immediately and marched straight to HR. I explained everything, how she was stalking me, using her admin access to dig into my personal details, and how she wouldn't stop sending these messages. At first, they didn't seem to care. They brushed it off like it was no big deal, saying things like, oh, she just has a crush, it'll pass, and you should feel flattered, really. Like, seriously? Just because I'm a guy, they didn't think I could be the target of harassment. Another month passed, and I got bumped up to Tier 2. It wasn't really a promotion. They didn't even give me a raise despite piling on more responsibilities, like handling disputes between hosts and guests. But at least I was on a different team now. Amy, Sarah, and Susan were assigned to different groups as well, which was a relief. Still, Susan found ways to creep me out. She'd follow me to the water cooler, just standing there while I filled my bottle, not even drinking, just standing silently behind me, then going back to her desk once I walked away. It was unsettling. Two weeks later, HR called me into their office. I thought, finally, they were going to take this seriously. Maybe they'd deal with Susan once and for all. But no, it wasn't what I expected at all. Instead, they told me Susan had filed charges against me. She claimed I tried to rape her in the bathroom. I was completely blindsided. I asked them what proof they had, and they told me they didn't need any. Her word alone was enough. After all, why would someone lie about something like that, right? Apparently, I had every reason to cover up my tracks while Susan was brave for speaking out. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I tried to leave the room, but security blocked the door. I pushed past them and snapped, you can't actually arrest me, so unless you've got something real, I'm going back to my desk. They let me go, and I hurried back to my computer, praying the messages from Susan hadn't disappeared when I blocked her on Hangouts. Thankfully, they were still there. I'd been smart enough to take screenshots of everything she'd sent me over the past few months. About 10 minutes later, two police officers arrived. They walked straight toward me, and before I knew it, they were putting cuffs on my wrists. I shouted, check my computer, just look at the screen. Suddenly, the entire production floor went silent. Around 200 people stopped what they were doing. Some even put their customer calls on hold to watch what was going down. One of the officers sat down at my desk and started scrolling through the messages. It felt like time was crawling by as everyone waited. Finally, the officer stood up and said, let him go. Next, they brought Susan over. The same cop, without missing a beat, looked her in the eye and said, I want the truth. Did this guy rape you? She nodded. The cop didn't flinch. Really? So, explain this message from two months ago where you said you'd accuse him of rape if he didn't let you come to his house. Susan's face turned pale. She broke down into tears, claiming it wasn't true, insisting I had been the one making advances when she wasn't interested. 
but the cop wasn't buying any of it. He said, Look, we've got all the evidence we need to show you're lying, but if you still want to press this claim, we can investigate further. Just keep in mind, if it turns out you're lying, you'll be facing charges. She doubled down, saying I'd assaulted her the day before in the women's bathroom. With that, I was officially arrested and taken in for questioning. They performed a rape kit on her, and the police requested a DNA sample from me for comparison. I didn't hesitate to give it to them, even though I knew the whole thing was ridiculous. Still, I ended up spending the next two days in jail. My family was notified, but I told them not to waste money on bail. I knew I was innocent, and I trusted the truth would come out. On the third day, I was released. No charges were filed because after more questioning, Susan admitted she had made everything up. The officers asked if I wanted to press charges for false accusations or try to file a defamation suit. I said no. I was just relieved she was fired and opted for a restraining order instead. But the damage was already done. My girlfriend broke up with me over the whole mess. Even though I was cleared, she said she couldn't trust me anymore. I tried explaining, but her mind was made up. On the bright side, I was able to return the engagement ring and use the money toward buying a new car. A few months later, the whole situation blew over. I moved to another part of town, started a new job, and prayed I'd never have to see Susan again. My name's Ryan. Though I was born in Italy, my family's originally from the States. I'd always wondered what living there would be like, so after saving up for a while, I finally planned a long trip to explore what life in America was all about. My plan was simple. Stay in a cheap rental, get a job, and eventually find a more permanent place to live. Once I arrived, I settled in fast, unpacking my stuff in an old Airbnb. After a long day, I decided to relax. I was lounging in the living room with the TV on when my phone buzzed with a message. It was weird because the number was local, and I didn't know anyone in the country yet. It wasn't the owner of the Airbnb either. When I opened the message, the casual confusion turned into pure fear. The text read, You're not alone. Leave. Now. My first thought was that it had to be a joke, maybe the owner's friend messing with me. But as I tried to brush it off, another message came in. Get out of the kitchen. Something bad's coming. That's when the fear hit. How did they know I was in the kitchen? My eyes scanned the room. Were there hidden cameras or something? I tried to shrug it off, convincing myself I'd be fine. Maybe I was overthinking things. Just then, another memory flashed in my head. I'd been at the doctor's office earlier. The doc had been giving me a strange look as I explained what happened with my hand. Listen, kid, I'm not accusing anyone, the doctor said, glancing at the bandages. But you don't have to cover for whoever did this. It couldn't have been an accident. A falling knife wouldn't leave a wound like that. I just nodded, not knowing what else to say. My hand still hurt as I walked back to the Airbnb, my mind a mix of confusion and fear. I tried replying to the strange texts, but nothing went through. Exhausted, I collapsed onto the bed, my hand throbbing, and fell into a heavy sleep. That night, I had one of the most terrifying dreams of my life. It wasn't about anything obvious like being chased or a car crash. It was different. In my dream, I saw through someone else's eyes, someone standing on the roof of the house, staring down at me as I slept. They were slowly making their way towards me, their intentions clear and dark. When I woke up, my room was quiet, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was horribly wrong. The moment I woke up, I knew something was off. The air smelled terrible, so bad it made me gag. My phone buzzing was the only thing that snapped me out of it, but when I saw the number again, the same one that had sent those creepy messages earlier, I froze. This time the message said, stay in bed and you'll die, get out now. It didn't seem like a threat anymore, more like a warning. I scrolled back through the old messages, realizing they all had the same tone. Could whoever was texting me be trying to help? They were right about the kitchen before, so maybe I should listen this time. Without hesitating, I got out of bed and went to the bathroom, figuring I'd brush my teeth and try to wake up a bit. 
As I rinsed my mouth, I heard a sound from my room, something I couldn't ignore. I peeked through the door and my heart nearly stopped. My bed was completely trashed, the mattress torn apart like someone had gone crazy on it. Before I could even process what I was seeing, my phone buzzed again. Another message. Leave the bathroom. Now. I didn't hesitate. I launched myself out of the bathroom, hitting the floor hard, just as the bathroom light shattered behind me. The door slammed shut with a deafening bang, and then the pounding started. It was like someone, or something, was locked in there, and they were furious. But that didn't make any sense. The bathroom was empty when I left. Still lying on the floor, I checked my phone again. Another message. I couldn't even read it before I heard a noise behind me. Turning slowly, I saw something crouched at the far corner of the room. My breath caught in my throat. It was a figure, pale as death, with skin so white it looked almost translucent. But it wasn't human. There was no nose, just smooth, flat skin, and its eyes. They darted from side to side, never settling, trembling like they were trapped inside its skull. And that smile. It was the worst part. Its grin stretched impossibly wide, like someone had cut it ear to ear. I was paralyzed, unable to move, just staring at this thing as it slowly stood up and started walking toward me, each step deliberate and agonizingly slow. I ignored my phone's frantic buzzing and bolted. I sprinted through the hallway, bursting into the kitchen and headed straight for the front door. My hands fumbled with the key as I jammed it into the lock. But no matter how hard I tried, the door wouldn't budge. The door wouldn't open. No matter how hard I tried, it was locked tight. That's when I noticed it. A small padlock keeping the door shut. Where had that come from? I had no time to think as I fumbled to pick it. But before I could make any real progress, I heard something behind me. My blood froze. I turned around slowly, and there it was. That thing. The pale creature with the frantic eyes and twisted smile. It was standing right there closer than ever. I could see every detail of its horrifying face now. Its eyes weren't looking at me. They darted around in all directions, never focusing. Its mouth opened slowly, as if it was savoring the moment. And in its hand, I saw it. A small, sharp kitchen knife raised and ready. I fell to the floor, tears welling up as I braced for what I thought would be the end. I couldn't fight it. There was nothing I could do. My only hope was that it would be quick, that the pain wouldn't last long. But then, something even more unbelievable happened. The creature was only a meter away from me when, out of nowhere, another figure appeared, stepping right through the wall like it wasn't even there. The wall didn't break, it just stretched, like it was made of something soft. The new figure grabbed the creature from behind, pulling it back. This new figure looked human, but I didn't have time to process what was happening. I just knew this was my only shot. Desperately, I started smashing the padlock with my phone, breaking both in the process. The lock was small and flimsy, and after a few hits, it finally gave way. I didn't waste a second. I threw open the door and bolted outside my heart racing as I ran. Behind me, the creature struggled, still trying to reach me. Even though it was being held back, its eyes, wild as ever, seemed to fixate on me. That smile never faltered, and it kept pushing forward, ignoring the human-like figure that was gripping it. The next morning I tried to put it all behind me, brushing off the whole thing as a break into the Airbnb. I told the owner that someone had gotten into the house during the night, the police arrived and started investigating, and right away, they noticed it too. The awful smell I'd been dealing with since I first arrived. After searching the house and finding nothing unusual, they tracked the smell to a spot near the entrance, right where I'd seen that strange figure pull the creature away. They asked the owner for permission to open up the wall, and after a few hours of breaking it down, they uncovered something horrifying. Behind the wall was a man's body, trapped in the concrete, his corpse was covered in stab wounds, his face twisted in pain. One of the officers gasped. This man's been dead for weeks. The owner recognized him instantly. He said the man had been the previous tenant of the Airbnb. 
He'd assumed the guy had left in a hurry because he never responded to any calls or messages. None of us understood how the man had ended up there, or what had happened to him. As they led us out of the house, I glanced back at the body, and that's when I saw it. His hand. It was clenched tight around a cell phone. Even though he'd been dead for weeks, the phone was still on. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new and enjoy creepy stories, make sure to hit that subscribe button below. I post fresh content every night. And before we dive in, please give this video a thumbs up. Thanks. I was sitting in the passenger seat of my sister Emma's car, grinning from ear to ear. My graduation ceremony had just ended, and I was now officially done with high school. Emma, who was next to me the whole time, had tears in her eyes when I walked across that stage. She had always been my biggest supporter, and I could feel how proud she was of me. Congrats, sis, Emma said as she started the engine. You're a high school grad now. I can't believe it. I beamed, feeling a rush of excitement. I can't believe it either. I wouldn't have made it without you, Emma. She reached over and ruffled my hair playfully. Of course, she said with a smile. I had to make sure my little sister turned out okay. We drove in silence for a few minutes, just enjoying the moment. Then, out of nowhere, Emma looked at me with a sneaky grin. You know what this means, right? I raised an eyebrow. What are you talking about? She smirked. It's time for ice cream. We gotta celebrate the right way. I couldn't help but laugh. We had this thing about ice cream. No matter what was going on, it was our go-to for any big moment. Let's do it. I said without a second thought. We drove to our favorite spot, this small old-fashioned ice cream shop on the edge of town. I got my usual, a double scoop of mint chocolate chip, and Emma got her go-to, cookie dough. We sat at one of the outside tables, chatting and enjoying the warm evening air. Emma asked me what I wanted to do next, and I told her all about my dream of becoming a vet. She listened closely, giving me advice here and there. After we finished our ice cream, Emma suggested we take a drive around the town. She said she had a couple of spots she wanted to show me. As we drove, she pointed out different places, sharing stories from when she graduated. We couldn't stop laughing as we remembered all the silly things we did when we were younger. The first stop was the park where we used to play as kids. Emma said she wanted to relive those days, so we walked around for what felt like hours, cracking jokes and taking goofy selfies. At one point, she even convinced me to go down the old slide, just like we used to when we were kids. I didn't think I'd fit anymore, but it was fun, just like back then. Afterward, we headed to the beach. The sun was setting, and Emma had packed a small picnic. Nothing fancy, just some snacks and a blanket. We sat in the sand, watching the waves crash and talking about everything from our future dreams to random childhood memories. The whole scene felt peaceful like one of those moments you never want to forget. It was so calming, and I realized how lucky I was to have a sister like her. As the sky got darker, Emma suggested we take the scenic route home. The road twisted through hills and forests, and we had the windows down, singing along to whatever was playing on the radio. I don't know how to explain it, but in that moment, everything just felt right. I didn't want the day to end. When we finally pulled into the driveway, our parents were sitting on the porch, waiting for us. They had this proud look on their faces that made my heart swell. I thought back to how much they'd supported me over the years, and it hit me just how much they'd sacrificed to get me to this point. We shared hugs and stories about the graduation and our day out together. Emma and I couldn't stop talking about all the fun we'd had, and our parents just smiled, happy to see us so close. As the evening wore on, we all gathered in the living room. The TV was on, but no one was really watching. We were just enjoying being together, telling stories and laughing at random memories. Sitting there, surrounded by my family, I felt this overwhelming sense of gratitude. Emma had gone out of her way to make my graduation day special, and I knew how rare it was to have a sister who cared so much. Before I knew it, the night was winding down, and Emma had to head back to her apartment. We hugged, said our goodbyes, and she drove off into the night. It felt strange how quickly the day was over, like it had passed in a blink. 
But I knew one thing for sure. Our bond as sisters had only gotten stronger. That night, I went to bed with a full heart and memories I knew I'd carry with me forever. The next morning, I was startled awake by loud knocking on the front door downstairs. It was around 4.30 a.m., and I was still half asleep, trying to understand what was going on. I couldn't figure out why I was the only one awake while my parents were still asleep. Slowly, I rolled out of bed, rubbing my eyes as I stumbled toward the door, wondering who could be banging so early in the morning. The knocking didn't stop the entire time I was making my way down the stairs, and soon, I recognized the familiar sound of Emma's impatient voice shouting, Get up! We've gotta go! When I opened the door, still groggy, I saw Emma standing there fully dressed, grinning like a kid on Christmas morning. Emma? What the heck? It's not even five yet? What's going on? I mumbled, trying to piece together the scene. We're going to Clearview Lake, she announced, practically bouncing on her toes. I rented a little cabin for us. It's a surprise trip. Her excitement was contagious, even if it was way too early. I smiled, but I couldn't help feeling a bit annoyed at being woken up so early. Couldn't we have left at a reasonable time? Why this early? I asked, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. Emma shrugged and laughed. Because we've only got one day and I want to make the most of it. Before I could protest, she was already dragging me toward the car. I had just graduated the day before, and this was her way of celebrating. There was no arguing with Emma once she had her mind set, so I rushed to get dressed and we headed out for the six-hour drive to Clearview Lake. During the drive, Emma kept talking non-stop about all the fun things we'd do once we got there. She had everything planned out, swimming, kayaking, maybe even some hiking. The best part, according to her, was that we had the whole place to ourselves. Despite my initial frustration, I couldn't help but get swept up in her excitement. The idea of spending the day by the lake, just the two of us, sounded pretty perfect. As we got closer to the lake, the scenery started to shift. The urban landscape slowly gave way to thick forests and open fields. It felt like we were leaving the rest of the world behind. When we finally arrived at the cabin, I was taken aback by how beautiful the area was. The photos Emma had shown me online didn't do it justice. The lake was crystal clear, reflecting the deep blue sky, and the surrounding trees were such a vivid green it almost didn't seem real. The cabin itself was tucked between the trees, with a big wooden porch that had rocking chairs and a hammock, perfect for kicking back and enjoying the peacefulness of the place. Inside, it was cozy and rustic, with wooden beams, a stone fireplace, and a fully stocked kitchen. It felt like a home away from home, and I was already looking forward to just relaxing after the long drive. That evening, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, Emma suggested we take a walk down to the lake. The water was so still it looked like glass, and the sky was glowing in soft hues of pink and orange. We passed a few families having picnics, couples walking hand in hand, and kids splashing around in the shallow water. The whole scene felt surreal, like something out of a picture-perfect postcard. Emma stopped suddenly, pulling out her phone. I need to get some pics for Instagram, she said, grinning. She made her way toward the water, eager to snap some photos of the perfect sunset over the lake. I sighed, rolling my eyes at Emma's usual need to get the perfect Instagram shot, but I didn't think much of it. She was my sister after all, and her quirky habits were part of why I loved her. But as the minutes ticked by, I started to feel uneasy. Emma was never this slow with her photos. She'd usually snap a couple and be done. Something didn't feel right. I decided to go check on her. As I approached the edge of the lake, I suddenly heard a loud splash. My heart leapt into my throat. My mind immediately jumped to the worst case scenario. I called out her name, louder this time, but there was no response. The silence that followed sent my anxiety skyrocketing. I started running, scanning the water, the shore, the trees, anywhere she could be. I shouted her name again, but still, nothing. Panic surged through me. I bolted back to the cabin, my pulse pounding in my ears and grabbed my phone. I dialed 911, my hands shaking. The next few hours were an absolute blur. The police arrived and combed through the lake, checked the other cabins nearby, and even extended the search to the surrounding woods. But there was no trace of Emma. 
It was like she had just vanished. Days bled into weeks, weeks became months. Still, there was no sign of my sister. The police did everything they could. They questioned everyone, dredged the lake multiple times, expanded the search to the entire area, but nothing. No one had seen or heard from her since that day by the water. The weight of my grief and guilt was crushing. If only I had gone with her. If only I hadn't let her wander off alone. Maybe I could have stopped whatever happened. I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that my sister, my best friend, was gone. All I had left were memories, unanswered questions, and an aching emptiness. The lodge, which had once felt like a peaceful escape, now felt suffocating. Every tree, every flower, the sound of the water, all of it was a painful reminder of that terrible day. The smell of the wildflowers that once felt refreshing now made me sick. I couldn't stand to be near them because they reminded me of how everything had changed in a moment. In my darkest hours, I couldn't help but let my mind wander to terrifying possibilities. Was Emma still alive somewhere, waiting to be found? Did something happen to her in the lake? Or worse, was she taken? I had no idea, and that uncertainty ate away at me every single day. The search for Emma lasted for years, but eventually, the case went cold. They never found her body, never found any solid leads, and just like that, the lake that once brought us joy became a place shrouded in mystery and pain. A place that had stolen my sister and left my family fractured. Even now, I visit the lake sometimes, hoping, maybe foolishly, that I'll find something, anything that gives me an answer. But every time the lake is as still as ever, betraying no secrets. The water remains calm, serene even. But for me, it's a constant reminder of the day Emma disappeared and the life we'll never get back. I'm 23 years old and live with my best friend, Maya. We've known each other forever, and she's the same age as me. Maya has a big, fluffy black cat named Shadow. He's part Maine Coon, so he's on the larger side, but a total sweetheart. Shadow usually hangs out in Maya's room, but occasionally he'll wander into mine when he's feeling curious. Strangely, whenever Maya isn't home, Shadow prefers to be around me. Which brings me to the first odd thing that happened. Maya works late shifts a lot, so I'm used to being by myself at night. This particular evening though, she had an earlier shift and was supposed to be back around 11 p.m. At the time, it was just me and my boyfriend hanging out, and we decided to call it a night and head to bed. It was around 9.30 p.m., so I knew Maya would be home soon. I made sure to shut my bedroom door, leaving Shadow outside in the hallway. My door has a solid latch and the AC draft will usually pull it closed completely. So I was positive that the door had closed all the way and latched securely. About 20 minutes later, I heard my door creak open and then softly close again. I was busy at the moment, so I brushed it off, thinking maybe the wind had somehow pushed it. Then, maybe 10 minutes after that, we started hearing faint meowing. When we finally finished what we were doing, we got up to go shower. As I stepped out of my room, I noticed Maya still wasn't home yet, which confused me. That's when Shadow darted out from under my bed, speeding past me and out the door into the living room. I was completely startled. I was certain I had left him outside my room earlier. How could he have possibly gotten in? How did Shadow get inside? That thought kept circling in my head. I remembered hearing the door open earlier, but I'd shrugged it off. Now, I was certain that Maya must have come home. I grabbed my phone and checked the apartment security app, but it confirmed what I already suspected. She still wasn't back. We also have a doorbell camera that would have alerted me if someone had entered. My boyfriend Liam was just as puzzled as I was, but he shrugged it off, saying maybe Shadow had been hiding under the bed all along. Sure, it's possible, but I knew what I heard. The door was completely closed, the latch had caught, and I distinctly heard the door creak open and shut again like someone had done it quickly, in just a couple of seconds. Still, I decided not to make a big deal out of it. Nothing like that had ever happened before, so I just chalked it up to my imagination or a fluke. Fast forward a few weeks to last night, October 28, 2023. 
I'd mostly forgotten about that weird incident. Maya and I had just come back from taking a big exam that morning, and we were both completely wiped out. Maya was waiting for her boyfriend Jake to show up, but once he arrived, I decided it was nap time for me. It was around 12.45 p.m. by then, and they stayed in the living room with Shadow while I headed to my room. I crashed onto my bed in a weird position, lying face down across it diagonally. I remember having some odd dreams, but I was in that heavy, deep sleep you get when you're totally exhausted. At some point, I heard my bedroom door open, and I could hear Maya and Jake's voices from the hallway. I was so tired that I didn't even bother moving, hoping they'd think I was still asleep and leave me alone. That's when I felt Shadow jump onto the bed. He started walking around, and eventually, I felt him settle on my legs, pressing his weight on the back of my calves. I shifted a bit to give him space, letting him get comfy. This went on for a few minutes until I felt him hop off the bed again. Then, I heard Maya's voice sounding surprised, saying, Oh my god, she's out cold, look at her. Jake responded, Yeah, let's leave her. I don't want to bother her while she's sleeping. That's kind of strange, I heard Maya say, followed by their playful giggles before the door clicked shut again. I didn't think much of it at the time. After waking up from my nap, I got ready to run some errands and noticed that Maya and Jake had gone to her room to sleep as well. They were both out cold, door slightly open like always, so Shadow could come and go as he pleased. After running my errands, I got back, and we all had dinner together. It was a nice, lively conversation, full of laughs. At one point, I thought it would be funny to bring up what happened earlier, so I joked about them letting Shadow into my room during my nap. But instead of laughing, they both went silent, staring at me like I'd said something weird. I explained what I heard, how I knew they'd open the door because I heard them talking and felt Shadow on my legs. Maya finally spoke, her face serious. Uh, we didn't get up. After you went to nap, we laid down too. Shadow was with us the whole time, and we never left the room. Why would we open your door? Now I was the one confused. Wait, are you sure? Maybe Shadow was meowing or scratching to get into my room and you opened it for him? I asked, trying to piece it together. I told them how I felt Shadow walking on me, even moving around for a while. But Maya kept denying it, Jake too. They insisted they hadn't left the room since we all laid down. They both started looking genuinely worried the more I described what had happened, every detail. It wasn't just in my head, I'd felt the weight of shadow on the bed, his paws pressing into the mattress. You can't fake that kind of feeling. I knew it was real. Still, they were convinced I'd had some kind of lucid dream or sleep paralysis, but I couldn't shake it. The sounds, the sensation, it was too clear, too vivid to be just a dream. This was the second bizarre thing that had happened since moving into this apartment, and both within the last month and a half. I'm honestly at a loss. Has anyone else experienced something like this? I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I'm just waiting for the next strange thing to happen. As a lifelong lover of books, I've always found comfort in getting lost in a story. So, when my uncle suggested we book a stay in an old manor to help me push through my writing slump, I jumped at the chance. We arrived on a rainy afternoon, the heavy clouds hanging low as the huge stone mansion came into view. My uncle, who adored anything related to history and architecture, was practically giddy, snapping photos and rambling about the place's background. I, on the other hand, was eager to step inside and start exploring. The moment we entered, a cold breeze hit me, sending chills down my spine. It wasn't just the temperature, it was the atmosphere. The furniture looked like it belonged in a museum, and the paintings, all in dark, ornate frames, seemed to watch every move we made. It didn't help that we were the only ones staying here since it was the off-season, adding to the eerie feeling that settled over the whole place. After putting my bags down in my room, I decided to walk around the grounds in search of inspiration for my book, which had been sitting at 5,000 words for weeks. As I wandered through the garden, a strange sensation crept over me, like someone was keeping tabs on me. There was something unnerving about this mansion. Its towering presence felt more threatening than I'd expected, 
and the thick fog hanging in the air only made it worse. This was supposed to be a getaway, but I couldn't shake the anxiety bubbling up inside. As night began to fall, the shadows seemed to grow longer, and the mansion took on an even more sinister vibe. That's when I started hearing strange noises. At first, they were faint, muffled footsteps and low whispers. My uncle, lost in a book in the study, either didn't notice or didn't care. But I couldn't ignore it. Curiosity and fear got the best of me, and I decided to check it out. My heart was pounding as I followed the sounds through the dimly lit corridors, where the flicker of the old light fixtures cast unsettling shapes against the walls. I thought I saw figures moving in the distance, barely more than shadows. My mind raced. Was this really happening? Or was I imagining things, like something out of one of the horror novels I loved? I kept my distance, watching the shapes glide through the hallways, unsure if they even knew I was there. They led me to a hidden door behind one of the dusty bookshelves, and I knew I shouldn't follow, but I couldn't help myself. My uncle would have been thrilled by my sudden bravery. As I squeezed through the tight space, the sounds around me got louder, clearer. The shadows from earlier? They weren't shadows at all. They were ghosts, clear as day, dressed in what looked like ancient clothes. And it wasn't just a small group either. They were having a full-on party, like some kind of twisted reenactment from the past. I never really believed in ghosts, but now, seeing them up close, I was beyond freaked out. I kept my distance, watching as they twirled and danced, completely ignoring me. But then, one of them stopped. It turned and locked eyes with me, and suddenly a scream ripped through the hallway, echoing so loudly it felt like it was coming from inside my own head. I froze. My brain was telling me to run, but something else in me wanted to stay, to understand what was happening. It was like my body was caught in this tug of war. Half of me terrified, the other half curious. But before I could make any kind of choice, my body made it for me. Without thinking, I turned and bolted down the passageway, my heart racing like I'd just seen death itself. When I burst into the library, out of breath, my uncle looked up from his book, clearly shocked at the state I was in. I could barely speak, but when he saw the panic in my eyes, he stood up right away. I tried to explain, my words tumbling out in a mess, but when we reached the secret passage, he didn't need to hear much. Even he could hear the faint screams echoing from deep within the walls. He muttered something about this being off limits, that the hosts hadn't mentioned anything about this part of the house. His usual calm demeanor was gone, replaced by a seriousness that made my stomach drop. He ordered me to cover the entrance, scolding me for even going near it in the first place. When night finally came, there was no way I was sleeping in my own room. I practically begged him to let me stay with him, and he didn't argue. That night was pure hell. Every little noise, every creak, whisper, or tap had me wide awake. I kept hearing faint sounds, like someone knocking on the door, or soft voices drifting through the walls. Even the wind rattling the lone window felt like something was trying to get in. It was the longest night of my life, and I couldn't shake the feeling that those spirits were watching us waiting for something. This place wasn't just creepy. It was truly, deeply, terrifying. I've never written a ghost story in my life. My books have always been about fantasy, elves, fairies, that sort of thing. I love crafting detailed worlds, but ghosts, paranormal stuff, never even crossed my mind. Honestly, I didn't believe in that kind of thing. Yet, unless the owners of the place had rigged some crazy prank with hidden speakers and projectors, there was no other explanation for what I saw that first night. It felt so real. Too real to be a trick of the light or my imagination running wild. The strangest part was that after that first night, it was like the spirits backed off. Maybe they sensed my uncle shutting it down and figured out I wouldn't go exploring again. After he chewed me out for messing around with that hidden passage, I didn't even dare glance in its direction. I was tempted. More than once, in fact but I was terrified of what I might find if I went back. Plus, my uncle wasn't the kind of guy you crossed. Growing up, we knew better than to test him. 
He wasn't afraid to dish out tough love if we didn't listen. So, I kept my distance, even though the curiosity gnawed at me every single day. For the rest of the week, I slept on the floor at the foot of his bed, too scared to stay in my own room. He teased me for it, calling me a scaredy cat, but he didn't really mind. In fact, I think he liked having the company, even if he wouldn't admit it. During the day, I spent most of my time wandering the gardens. They were massive, over a hundred acres of perfectly trimmed hedges and open meadows. There was this beautiful little spot in the middle of a carved hedge maze where a stone table and chairs sat, almost like something out of a fairy tale. I'd sit there for hours, trying to focus on my writing. At the time, I was working on my third chapter, about 6,000 words in. That's why I'd asked my uncle to bring me here in the first place. I needed a change of scenery to break through my writer's block. It worked too. I managed to churn out a good chunk of my novel while we were there. By then, writing was my full-time gig. I had one book on Kindle, and a small publisher had picked up my second one, which was doing okay in a niche market. I couldn't complain. It was a dream come true. Even though the experience at the mansion scared the hell out of me, it helped in its own strange way. But that passageway? We never went back to it. Not once. And I have to admit, part of me regrets that. Every now and then, I catch myself thinking about it, wondering why I didn't go further. What were those spirits trying to show me? What would have happened if I'd followed them all the way? I guess I'll never know. I pulled up to what was supposed to be my final rest stop before reaching my main destination the next morning. It was late, and after a couple of really draining days behind the wheel, I was ready to crash. I grabbed my worn-out backpack from the car and headed into the Airbnb I'd booked for the night. The house was tucked away off some random street, not too far off my planned route. I hadn't really bothered researching it much, since I only needed a place to sleep for a few hours. As long as it had a bed, I didn't care much. The second I stepped inside, a sharp, nasty smell hit me. It wasn't like something terrible had happened, just gross, like maybe there was something dead under the house, or the air was heavy with mildew. I didn't think much of it. I took a quick glance around, poked my head into the bedroom in the bathroom, and noticed that the smell seemed to linger more in the bedroom. It was stronger there, so I made the call to set up camp in the living room. I tossed my stuff on the couch and grabbed a throw blanket from one of the chairs. While spreading the blanket out, I heard a loud thud echo through the walls. It wasn't a small creak or the kind of sound you brush off as the house settling. This noise was solid, like something heavy had dropped, but it was impossible to tell where it came from. I was more confused than scared. I headed down the hallway and peeked into the rooms again, but everything seemed normal. Nothing out of place or broken. I wasn't even sure what I was expecting to find. Still, I figured it couldn't be anything to worry about for just one night. I went back to the couch, finished setting it up, and lay down with my phone. I had some trip planning to do, so I started going over my schedule for the next few days. Not five minutes later, I heard the noise again. Same thud, same weird feeling. It was like the walls absorbed the sound making it hard to tell where it came from. This time, I got up and checked more carefully. I flipped on the lights in every room and scanned the walls and ceiling. But everything looked the same as before. Still no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I tried convincing myself it was probably just a branch swaying in the wind, smacking against the roof or something. But even that felt like a stretch. I returned to the couch, telling myself it didn't matter. I was only here for a few more hours, and whatever was going on wasn't my issue. I switched off the lights, lay back down, and quickly drifted off, my body heavy with exhaustion. The house was quiet, and I slept deeply, until I didn't. The way I woke up felt odd. I was half asleep, my eyes still shut, barely aware I was waking up at all. I almost brushed it off as a dream, but then, out of nowhere, that gut-wrenching feeling kicked in. Something wasn't right. I opened my eyes, and there he was, a man, just standing there, leaning over me. His eyes locked on mine. My entire body froze, every muscle tensed up. 
It lasted only a split second before he bolted. He ran, straight down the hallway and out the front door, slamming it behind him. I jumped up, my heart pounding, and raced to the door, hoping to catch a glimpse of where he went. But he was already gone, swallowed by the trees surrounding the house. I slammed the door shut, my mind racing. I reached for my phone, but as I walked back toward the hallway, something caught my attention. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something I hadn't seen before. A folding ladder hanging down from the ceiling, leading up to the attic. That's when I panicked. Without wasting another second, I called the police. As you'd probably guess, the man had been staying up there, hiding in the attic. From the looks of things, he hadn't been there too long, maybe a day or two at most. There wasn't much up there, just a couple of old blankets and some food wrappers. Still, the whole thing left me shaken. He'd probably been using the place as a hideout, but the thought of him watching me sleep? That was a nightmare all on its own. If I hadn't woken up, who knows what might have happened. My sister and I had never taken a trip, just the two of us, without our parents. Sure, we had family vacations with our mom before, but those trips were always hectic. Our mom, after the divorce, would plan these intense schedules, museum visits, long bus rides, and flights right after. It wasn't really relaxing, so this time, we decided to book a five-day getaway somewhere new. We both get tired of staying in one place too long, Anything more than a week gets boring. We tried Airbnb for the first time and lucked out. The apartment was on the top floor with a huge balcony. You could see the whole intersection and streets leading off into different parts of the city. One street even went down to the harbor if you followed it past the tennis courts and some hotel parking lots. Every night we'd go out for dinner. Seafood was the specialty around here, and each night we'd venture further and further from our apartment in search of new spots to eat. On the last day, we found a restaurant that served sea urchin, about a 45-minute walk from where we were staying. The people there were incredibly nice. After every meal, they'd bring out dessert for free and offer this strong brandy called Rocky. I'm not a big drinker, so one shot was more than enough for me, but my sister? She could handle her liquor, so she finished the rest of the bottle. She said it would be rude to waste it. Full and slightly tipsy, we started walking back toward the apartment passing the harbor again. The streets were packed with tourists, but only until you reached the bend near the tennis courts. After that, it was just us, walking the quiet stretch back home. What we didn't expect was to see a group of people camped out in the parking lot, under the glow of the tennis court lights. It looked like they were getting ready to settle in for the night. Greece is known to be a landing spot for refugees and other groups, but we hadn't seen many around Heraklion. Still, Something about being the only two girls on the street made me uneasy. My sister, still feeling good from the alcohol, didn't seem to notice. That's when I heard footsteps behind us. They were slow, but steady, shuffling in our direction. I glanced back and saw a tall, thin figure in the shadows, just far enough away that he couldn't grab us yet, but close enough to make me nervous. He starts speeding up, clearly trying to match our pace. Hey, hello, he calls out but I ignore him. He gets closer, coming up on my right side. Hi, he says again. I glance at him quickly, tall, thin, but he's got some muscle. There's something weird about his walk though, like he's limping. My gut tells me this isn't someone I want to be dealing with in the middle of the night. My sister, a bit tipsy, notices him and asks, who is that? No idea, I say. Just keep moving. The guy passes me now targeting my sister, maybe thinking she's an easier mark because she's had a few drinks. He starts speaking in a language we don't understand. My sister, confused, responds, What? Uh, we only speak English. I grab her arm and pull her a little faster, steering her toward the middle of the street. Don't talk to him, just keep going. That's when he lunges and grabs her by the arm, trying to pull her back. My heart races. Instinct kicks in. I step up to him, shoving him hard in the chest and yelling, Get off her! With his limp, he stumbles back, losing balance for a second. I don't stop to look. I grab my sister's hand and we pick up the pace. But that's when I catch a glimpse of him grinning. Finally, 
We make it to the intersection and rush inside the building. The front door is always unlocked, so I drag my sister into the elevator, pressing the button for the third floor as fast as I can. She's shaken up, but more pissed off than scared. We lock ourselves in the apartment and turn off all the lights. From the balcony, we watch as the guy paces back and forth at the entrance of our building, slipping in and out for what feels like forever. He finally leaves after an hour. I work as a writer, and I often travel to quiet, remote spots to get away from distractions. I've stayed in some eerie places before, but they never bothered me, until last year. I booked a small cabin through a rental app, right by a large, still lake. The view was incredible, and it was one of the most peaceful places I'd ever been. There wasn't a soul around for miles. The owner, let's call him Rick, handed over the keys and gave me his number for emergencies. The cabin was two floors, ideal for someone staying alone. I chose the upstairs bedroom because it had a porch overlooking the water. It was the perfect spot to get some writing done, with the moon shining on the lake like a painting. I got so caught up in my work that I didn't realize how late it was. I must have been too focused because suddenly, I felt a warm breath on the back of my neck. My stomach dropped. I spun around, but the room was empty. There was no way anyone else was here. I was in the middle of nowhere. Trying to shake it off, I convinced myself it was just my imagination playing tricks. After a quick meal, I turned out the lights and went to bed. The moonlight pouring in from the porch gave the room an eerie glow, just enough to see shapes in the dark. I don't know when exactly, but sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up drenched in sweat. The room was stifling hot. I wiped my face, barely awake, and opened my eyes. Through my blurry vision, I saw her, a frail, old woman sitting on the edge of my bed. Her skin was pale, almost glowing, and she stared at me with hollow eyes. Before I could even process what I was seeing, her mouth opened wide, and she vomited thick, black goo all over me. I screamed and shot up, frantically wiping my face. But the woman, she was gone, vanished like she was never there. My heart was pounding. It was just a nightmare, I told myself. I drank too much. I calmed down, had some water, and tried to get back to sleep. But after that night, everything started to spiral. Every night I woke up in a cold sweat, and she was always there, staring at me, never saying a word. By the fourth night, I could barely sleep. I wanted to call Rick, but I couldn't bring myself to. What would I even say? I was losing my grip. One afternoon, while taking a shower, I felt something strange. The water suddenly stopped, and as I reached for the tap, my hand brushed against something thin and bony, like a hand. I was so freaked out that I slipped right into the tub. Thankfully, I didn't break anything, but I was shaking. I had already paid for the whole month, though, and leaving because of some creepy visions just didn't sit right with me. But that night, something changed for good. I was too scared to fall asleep. But after what felt like hours, I finally passed out. Then, I woke up to this faint sound of crying. At first, I thought it was part of a dream. I sat up in bed, expecting to see her, like always, hovering by the side of the bed. But no, this time she stood at the doorway, her face buried in her hands, shaking as she cried. What do you want? I called out, my voice shaky. Why are you doing this? She didn't respond, just kept sobbing. Please tell me. I know you're real. I'm not crazy, I shouted, desperate for answers. Then slowly, she moved her hands away from her face, and I saw it. She had no eyes. Where her mouth should have been was this gaping, jagged hole that stretched unnaturally wide. A low, raspy moan escaped from it. I swear my heart stopped right then. But instead of coming at me like I expected, she raised one thin hand and pointed down the hallway. I stayed frozen in bed, watching her for a few seconds. But something urged me to follow. It was like I was being pulled, no longer in control of my own body. She floated down the stairs, her form barely visible in the dim light, and stopped at a door at the end of the hallway. The basement door. She looked back at me, 
that same moaning sound filling the air again. Her hand pointed to the rusted padlock on the door before she vanished into thin air. I would have fainted if this had happened before, but this time, I knew she was trying to tell me something. What was in the basement? Why was it locked? I needed to know. Grabbing a heavy metal vase from the hallway, I smashed the padlock until it broke open. As soon as I pulled the door open, a wave of the most disgusting smell I've ever experienced hit me. It reeked of something rotting. My stomach churned, but I had to see what was down there. With a flashlight in hand, I descended the creaky stairs, each step making the stench worse. At first I couldn't see much, just shadows and dust. But as I moved closer to the far end of the room, the smell became unbearable, like something dead was rotting right in front of me. The beam of my flashlight landed on it, and I froze. There, slumped in the corner, was a body. A woman, long dead, decaying. Her face was covered in maggots, her eyes gone, and her mouth frozen open in a silent scream. I was about to call Rick, the cabin owner, when something caught my eye. Hanging on the wall was an old, dusty family photo, laminated and framed. My blood ran cold when I realized it was Rick, standing next to the woman whose corpse was lying right in front of me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. He had killed her, his own mother, and instead of burying her or calling the police, he'd hidden her down here, maybe planning to come back later to finish the job. I dropped my phone in shock, but I knew I had to call the cops, not Rick. It took them over an hour to make it out to the cabin, but when they did, I finally felt like I could breathe again. I left that place immediately, shaking from head to toe. A few days later, I saw the news. Rick had been arrested, charged with the murder of his mother. Apparently he confessed to killing her for her money and the property, which she refused to hand over. Part of me feels relieved that her spirit can rest now, that I helped bring her justice, but every now and then I wake up in a cold sweat, terrified I'll open my eyes and see her again, sitting on the edge of my bed, her hollow face watching me in silence. My name is Liam. I'm 25 and have been living with my best friend and roommate for nearly nine years now. We moved into our first apartment right after finishing college, and that's when things started to get strange. This is about our nightmare neighbor, someone who made us truly afraid for our lives. To this day, I'm shocked that no one did more to stop him. Here's a rundown of the people involved. The neighbor? His name's Sean, and I'm not changing it because he doesn't deserve to hide from what he did. My roommate is Jay, his girlfriend is Kay, and Sean's little girl is M. About five months after Jay and I settled in, Sean, Kay, and M moved into the apartment below us. Sean worked as a maintenance guy for the complex, and even though I didn't know Kay personally, Sean seemed cool at first. We'd exchange small talk, and he'd sometimes help with minor things around the apartment, like when I accidentally knocked out my window screen, and he popped it back in for me. But soon, the nice guy act wore off, and his true self started to surface. Jay burst into my room one morning, looking freaked out. He showed me a video of Sean and Kay arguing. It got heated and Sean completely lost it, chucking his Xbox at Kay as she tried to get into her car. He then sprinted over, trying to break into the car as she sped off. I immediately told Jay to send the video to our building's management. But, to our utter disbelief, they brushed it off, saying it was a private matter. Furious, we demanded they bar Sean from our apartment, worried about our own safety. We didn't want him near us anymore. From that day on, we avoided him at all costs. We could hear the fights between Sean and Kay getting worse. Her crying was becoming a constant background noise. When Kay finally left for good, the atmosphere grew even darker. Sean was now taking his anger out on his walls, screaming and smashing things. It was terrifying. We started recording everything, hoping the mounting evidence would prove just how dangerous he was becoming. G would still show up every now and then to see her dad, but every visit seemed to end badly. Either they'd fight, or we'd have to endure their wild, angry sex sessions, which were so loud we could hear everything, no matter where we were in the apartment. It got unbearable. Things reached their breaking point just a few weeks later. Jay was at work, and I had the day off. I was half asleep on the couch, our cat curled up next to me, 
when she suddenly jumped down, spooked by something. I strained my ears and immediately picked up the shouting and banging coming from downstairs. It sounded bad. I rushed to my room and could clearly hear G and M screaming, both of them crying while Sean was losing it, yelling and throwing things. My hands were shaking as I grabbed my phone to record the noise. I hurried to my closet, grabbed a baseball bat and called Jay, then my parents, who lived nearby. The next call was to 911. I kept recording, my heart pounding in my chest, until Jay got home. As soon as she stepped through the door, Sean and G spilled outside, with G sobbing and shouting that Sean had hit her. We caught it all on video. We rushed to G, telling her we'd already called the police, while Sean muttered curses at us under his breath, his face twisted with anger. After G left, M and I both called our partners, and Jay tried to keep me calm. I was a mess, crying and shaking. My parents showed up soon after, and my dad, a huge guy built like a tank, planted himself by the door, acting as our protector. He stood on the porch, arms crossed, eyes locked on Sean like a hawk. The moment the cops pulled up, Sean tried to put on a show, suddenly playing with M on the sidewalk like they were some picture-perfect family, all while throwing passive-aggressive glares at my dad. He wasn't fooling anyone though, and I could feel my blood boiling wishing I could smack that smug grin right off his face. The cops took our statements and we showed them all the videos and recordings we'd collected. We explained how Sean had been getting more violent over the past month. After we handed over our evidence, we headed back inside, but I couldn't relax. From our apartment, we could see Sean's door slightly ajar, just enough for him to peer out at us, glaring with pure hate. It gave me chills. I sat with my parents, trying to calm down, while keeping an eye on the ring camera feed, hoping the police would finally do something. It wasn't long before the smell of weed started seeping into our place. Then the thudding began. Sean was pounding on the walls again, wailing and screaming. Just as it started to feel unbearable, we saw a cop knock on his door. And moments later, Sean was led away in handcuffs. The relief we felt was immediate. Finally, we thought, this nightmare is over. But we were wrong. Two days later, Sean was back. I found out when Jay texted me, and the anxiety hit me like a wave. I was at work, hands shaking, my stomach in knots, wondering what would happen next. Sean was back in his apartment, but without G or M. We only saw G maybe once in a while, probably just coming over for a quick hookup. What was more common, though, was Sean bringing home this younger girl, someone who couldn't have been much older than me or Jay. They'd get drunk, and we'd hear the usual, their voices, the laughing, the fighting, and everything in between. On top of that, Sean's yelling and banging on the walls became a daily occurrence. Any sound we made would set him off, pounding on our ceiling as if we were purposely trying to bother him. He had this stupid little golf cart he used for work, and whenever he wasn't riding around, he'd walk off somewhere to hide and smoke weed. When he wasn't doing that, he was basically hotboxing his apartment and some of that always seemed to seep into ours. If we saw him anywhere, inside or outside the building, he'd shoot us a death stare, as if us existing was some huge offense. It got so bad that he'd almost run into people or drive into things because he was too focused on glaring at us. Other neighbors even mentioned how weird it was. We caught him on our ring camera a few times making exaggerated gestures to mess with us, probably thinking he was clever. And if that wasn't bad enough, we had a roach problem, too. I swear, no matter how many times we complained to management, they just shrugged it off. The assistant manager was the only one who seemed to care, but even he couldn't really help. The whole situation was a nightmare. The last week Sean was here, he had that same young girl over, along with one of her friends. They were hammered and making so much noise, yelling and laughing in the room directly beneath mine until 3 a.m. Even with earplugs in and white noise blasting, I could still hear them. I tapped the floor once, hoping they'd quiet down, but instead, Sean lost it. He screamed louder than ever before and pounded on the ceiling so violently that I was genuinely terrified he'd come to our door. I ended up crying, scared out of my mind, wondering what he might do next. At this point, work had drained me to the core. I was depressed, barely functioning, and dealing with Sean on top of it all felt like the final straw. Then, 
One day, after one of the absolute worst days at my job, I came home to find that Sean's car was gone. I peeked through his window, and the place was empty. He had moved out completely. I ran upstairs to tell Jay, and we both screamed with joy, actual tears streaming down our faces. We ran downstairs to check out the now-abandoned apartment, looking in at the filthy carpet and the holes punched into the walls. The damage was unreal. I'm sure it cost the apartment management a fortune to fix all of it. Sean was definitely fired too, because we haven't seen him around the complex since. Our new downstairs neighbors are a breath of fresh air, a sweet Puerto Rican grandma and her adult grandkids. They've been nothing but kind, and we've already warned them about the management's lack of effort when it comes to fixing things. Hopefully, they'll never go through what we did. To wrap this all up, I just want to say one thing to Sean. Screw you. I hope your life is a complete disaster, that you never see G or M again and that every woman you ever meet recognizes you for the pathetic, abusive man-child you are. I hope you rot in hell with the rest of the scum like you.